I'm calling a meeting to order. I'm going to do a roll call first. Well, please be patient. My voice is not real good tonight. Uh, Mr. Decker. Present. Mr. Sokolowski. Present. Oh, I am present. Alex. Here. John. Yes. Here. David. Here. And uh, Jennifer, our new member, welcome. Thank you, present. <clears throat> Did everyone have a chance to review the minutes of the last meeting? I haven't. Alex? Of course I did. Oh, you wrote them. I'm sorry. <laughs> John. I've seen them. Yeah. You did. Okay. Um, I guess we can take a vote if we wanted to uh, accept those minutes. Want to give Mr. Decker an opportunity to review them? I can just oh. abstain, John. That way I can uh, bring up my information later. Okay. If I have any. Okay. Are you all right with that, Bob? Yeah. Okay. You want to vote on that? That's fine. I'll okay. just. We're going to, we're going to vote on the minutes of the last meeting. And I don't think previous meeting, I just think this last one. Okay. Bob's abstained. Adam. Yes. Yes. Adam. Yes. Um, and John. Yes. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> um, I didn't get any mail, so I don't think I have to look at anything. We are here to uh, continuation of current discussions. Discuss monitoring this meeting. What's yeah. Are we all set, Jen? Jen, you. Oh. Yeah, we're all set. And Jan Remillard, you're off. Thank you. <clears throat> Continuation of permit conditions discuss South Deerfield DG series LLC. The project proposed is a development to the construction of a 93, 19 plus or minus square foot retail building with associated site improvements on the property located on Mill Village Road. Map 123, lot 28 and 20, 29 and 30. S special permit is requested for the, for the proposed retail use of commercial C11 district under the standards of section 5300. I'm gonna, Adam, Adam, yes. Adam Costa. Yes. Okay, um, would you like to uh, give us a brief overview of how we're going to approach this. I'd be happy to, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, so we had discussed during the last deliberation session of the board, my preparation of a decision and approval with conditions for the board to review at tonight's meeting. And we had talked about sort of a two step approach to uh, compiling the conditions of approval. Uh, the first step was that board members individually would uh, craft letters or emails that they would send to me through uh, Jennifer Gannett and that I would then take those various proposed conditions and would uh, structure them, restructure them, attempt to work them into a form of decision, a form of uh, approval with conditions of the uh, project that's before the board and that the board would review that form of decision tonight. So that's what I've done. I have a form of decision and I think the, the easiest way to do it and I'll defer to you, Mr. Chairman, but um, the way that I've been doing things for the better part of nine or 10 months now when it comes to this stage in the proceedings is to uh, share my screen so you can see the decision and then walk through it sort of page by page. It's an 11 page decision. It's not um, the shortest decision I've ever written. It's also not anywhere near the longest decision I've written. Um, much of it is uh, procedural background. Uh, there's a portion that is comprised of findings of fact. Uh, and then of course, there are the conditions of approval. And then on the, on the back end of the decision, there is the vote of the board and, and uh, all of the, the requisite 
notices uh, of appeal and whatnot to the applicant and to the public. So um, I suspect it'll take us, you know, the better part of half an hour, 45 minutes, an hour to get through the decision, depending upon how many comments or questions board members have and how much input there might be. Uh, some of the conditions I received from certain members were uh, simple enough that I could incorporate them. And of course, in, in crafting the decision, even before I reviewed uh, in any detail the, the specific conditions or proposed conditions I received from board members, I look back at my notes from the various sessions of the public hearing uh, in attempting to determine appropriate findings. I, I cited to statements made by individual board members uh, in support of an approval of the project. Um, and then I had highlighted some things as potential future conditions if the project were to be approved. So some of the conditions I received from the members were simple enough. I was able to work them in. Um, maybe they were already a part of a condition. <coughs> um, others were, were more complex. Either they were a bit vague and so I wasn't sure exactly what was meant to be accomplished or I had some technical or legal issue with them. So I attempted to work everything into this one document that I'm going to share. Um, I did take a series of conditions, I think maybe five or six total of all the various ones I received from board members. And I added them to the very end of the decision under a section that I called other conditions. And those were conditions that I, I really had some sort of a techno, te technical or legal issue with, uh, or, or that I thought were insufficiently specific um, that I, I didn't think could exist in their current form. I wanted to include them anyway so that I was being comprehensive and capturing everything that ev every member had sent to me. So that's a document that I'm pre prepared to share when you're ready for me to do that, Mr. Chairman, and then we can begin to walk through it. Thank um, you. Bernie, may I say something? Y yes, Jen. Um, I just wanna let everybody, all the board members know that I sent an email just after you convened that has it, so you have it in paper form to look at later. Uh, can, uh, point of order. Can, yes, John. Uh, yes, can, uh, before Adam Acosta starts going over it, can, okay, since you've given us an email, I would like the opportunity to print it out so I can follow it along on paper rather than having to look at it in a computer screen. Uh, may I have uh, five minutes, just, uh, or two minutes to print it out if I can upload it and print it? John, John, we were, that's what we were going to do um, because I don't have one either. And Mr. Sokolowski was going to print mine out. So we're, we're going to, we're going to take a, I think a five minute, whatever you want to call it to um, uh, print these out so we can have them on hand. Because we'll talk about that later, but does anyone have an objection to doing that? Well, uh, you know, if I could say, I, you know, I just pulled it up as we were, uh, talking about this, you know, I think, uh, as, as some of you may know, and I think you all know, that I requested to take a look at the opinion beforehand, so we weren't forced to kind of read and digest mm -hmm. an 11-page opinion without having any kind of prior knowledge as to what the findings of fact or anything like that was on it. I was told that it was impossible because it may have included some some of the comments that might violate the open meeting law. I don't know why that couldn't have just been redacted and we could have seen it beforehand, but I would like at least, I mean, if it's 11 pages, I'd like a little time to read it over. Uh, I mean, I think it's a lot to ask not having seen it and um, in trying to digest it. Um, you know, even, even 20 minutes is probably not enough, but um, I, I kind of, I don't know what you all think, but I, but it's hard to go over something and never, never having seen it before. Well, we don't know what we haven't seen. So I would think that I will, I will help Bernie technically print it out. I have it on my screen now, if we want to take a five minute recess and, um, I don't know, Mr. Decker, do you want me to run a copy over to your residence? I would appreciate it. All right, John, you want me to run one down to you or you got a printer? Uh, you're gonna have to go a long ways to get to me. I have a printer at my house. Okay. Okay, Jennifer, comment. Adam, um, well, I just wanna tell you that it's in a PDF form that has the note section. So if you print it, it's gonna be really tiny. You have to like, it's, it's very easy to read if it's up on the screen, if Adam shares it and, um, and then you can have a paper copy to write your notes next to it. Um, 
And I thought you were, Adam Costa, were you gonna be going um, through it anyways, just line by line? Was that your intent? I, I, I will be. So, um, so this, this is the challenge that exists with, with, with every project of, of any substance, that when, when the board members opt not to fully deliberate on every condition in their deliberation sessions, but want to provide me with a list of conditions individually, one at a time, uh, one member at a time, and I am then to compile that, th those various potential conditions into a single decision. The open meeting law says that I can't then circulate that document amongst board members. It's, it's a frustrating provision of the open meeting law. It was questioned, uh, it's been questioned. There are open meeting law determinations on point. We just got an opinion in another case in another community within the past month or so, confirming this interpretation. There's a case that went to the Supreme Judicial Court about two years ago on this very issue where there were uh, various, uh, various documents received from different members and compiled. And the, the Division of Open Government is of the opinion that even though you may not assign a name to a particular comment, when somebody in my position, for example, acts to compile the opinions from various board members in the forms of conditions or otherwise, and then circulates that amongst the board, the terminology that the division has used is that I, I'm acting as a conduit for an open meeting law violation. I'm just sort of a, a straw man, a, a go-between. So it's incredibly frustrating, but the options are either you disclose it at a meeting like this and don't, don't circulate it in advance, which I realize puts members at a disadvantage, or you don't, don't send individual comments to me in advance, which just results in a, a lengthier deliberation session once the, the, the basic board plate conditions are disclosed because none of the specifics are in there. So I'm, ha I'm happy to, to sit by. If board members need five minutes, 15 minutes, a half an hour to familiarize themselves with the decision. That's fine by me. I understand that 11 pages is a lot to look at and digest all at once. I, I mean, I just took a look through it. I think we're pretty much on the same page of what we talked about for the past eight, eight or nine months here. So um, I make a motion for a 10 minute uh, recess or do you want to do a 20 minute recess? Let's split it fifth. No, Mr. Decker. 15 minutes is probably enough. All right, that's, yeah, okay. All right, I'll make motion, a motion, motion? For, 15, for a 15 minute recess. Do I have a second? Second it. Second it. All in favor? It's gonna be a roll call. Yeah, Mr. Decker? Yes. Uh, I'm in favor. Alex? Yes. Adam? Uh, yes, in favor. And John? No. Okay. Motion 15 carries. Minutes enough? 15 minute recess. Okay, Bob's back. Now we're ready. John's back. So everybody that's out there, if you send me emails while I'm running the meeting, I don't necessarily get them. So I did answer a few. So I apologize if I don't get to it. I have like three forms of communication going on. So. Okay, Alex, uh, we're just waiting for Alex. Alex, you out there? Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Costa, are you out there, Attorney Costa? I am. <laughs> okay, I guess we can get started. Um, attorney Costa, I was going to run just run it by. I'm going to run it by you. What I thought we'd do is we would um, read the condition and then um, for comments, and then we take a vote on each one of the each one of the uh, comments. Is that a reasonable procedure for us to follow? So the the board doesn't necessarily, and I, I defer to you, Mr. Chairman, and I defer to the board. Um, it, it is it would be unique for the board as a whole to vote on each one of what are, forget the total number, uh, 30, 30 conditions plus or minus. Um, the, the norm would be to discuss the individual conditions and to vote the decision as a whole. Okay, um, that, that's I, what you recommend we do. I don't have a problem with that. Board members? Well, it, it's, it's less of a recommendation and more of standard practice, but okay. I, I do have some boards in some circumstances that would prefer to if not vote the conditions individually, then maybe vote on specific conditions if there, there is not a consensus amongst the board with respect to a certain condition. Okay, Mr. Sokolowski. 
Well, like Mr. Costa said in the beginning, what he wanted to do was share a screen, go through it, go through why some things are <coughs> potentially unlawful in his opinion um, or outside of our scope of jurisdiction. And then um, after he does that, I think we're ready to take a vote on on if we want to, you know, take a vote on approving or denying the special permit. So I think it's time to let Mr. Casa do the sheet, the screen share. And if people have questions, then they can ask, ask, you know, why things were, were pulled out or what, what the back or, uh, you know, basis of his notes were. That's the five of us have any questions, right? The five of us. Yeah. Okay. I don't have a, I don't have a problem with it either way. Um, Mr. Casa, will you, I got my voice is not real good. So I think it would be, would help me out if you read those, please. I'm happy to do that. So let me let me try and share my screen here as best I can. <coughs> uh, Mr. Costa, I'm sorry. Uh, Mr. Chair, may I speak? It's John Sikorsky. Yes. yes. Uh, Mr. Costa, do you think you should review your opinion first before we get to the conditions? Because I have some questions on your findings of fact. Yes, absolutely. I'm not going to proceed. Uh, I wouldn't recommend proceeding directly to the conditions. I think the entire decision should be reviewed. I, I would agree with that. I think that it's it's important that the board uh, achieve consensus, at least amongst the requisite supermajority, uh, on on specifics, uh, uh, both of the findings of fact and the the conditions themselves. Okay. So, can all of you see that? Yes. Yeah. Oh, one, one thing, please, board members, please, if you're going to speak, um, get recognized and uh, tell us who you are, because poor Alex is going to have to try and scribe this by a scribe. And I think it makes it a little easier for him if you, he knows who is speaking. Correct, Alex? Okay. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you. And I, I'm not always following myself. <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, uh, Attorney Costa. That's okay. So, um, I discussed even even before this specific project and, and uh, the board instructing me or requesting of me that I draft the decision. I had discussed recently with uh, with Ms. Gannett the the reality that your board doesn't have a, a a form decision per se, as I understood it, a decision that you use with with frequency over and over again. Um, some boards do, some boards don't. Uh, in some communities. Um, but um, I wanted to use something that was familiar to, to, to Deerfield. So um, what I did is I took a form of decision that I had used previously, not something that I originally drafted, but that has been used historically by the planning board, just in terms of how the decision itself is structured. And that's what I used here for purposes of crafting uh, the decision of the board. So you can see here on the first page of the decision, and I've got it um, the, the entire page can't be viewed at once because I've zoomed in just a bit so we can all read it on the screen. But you can see that the first page, in fact, really the first couple of pages is just the preliminary information about the application. So identifies uh, the action by the board granting the special permit. Again, this is pres a presumption that that is the outcome because I was instructed to draft an approval with conditions. It identifies the applicant. It identifies uh, the development proposal, which is for a 9,319 square foot retail sales establishment together with associated site improvements. And then for the remainder of the first page and onto the second page, it has all the key information, most of which is taken directly from the application uh, form or the accompanying materials submitted by the applicant uh, many months ago. Uh, Locus, zoning district, both the owner and applicant identities and addresses the deed references for the parcel the uh, title of the site plan, and we'll get into momentarily uh, how the different versions get addressed, the preparer, the date and revision date of the site plan, uh, identification of each of the individual sheets that comprise the site plan, um, scale of the plan, and then similarly, and this is something that I added particular to a special permit that wouldn't necessarily apply in the context of a planning board site plan review, uh, and that is elevation title, preparer, date of those elevations, number of sheets, scale of the elevation. So just basic information, and this is all subject to confirmation uh, by, by, by Jennifer, uh, confirmation by the board as to the accuracy of the, the information I worked off of 
um, what, what had been pr provided to me through the course of these proceedings, but I don't have the official record that's in the town's possession. So we would want to confirm all of this information before the decision is finalized. Um, similarly, the next section, which is the record of the proceedings, um, I had partial information. So I had a copy of the application package that was submitted by uh, South Deerfield DG series back in, I believe, December of 2019. Um, that was the date on the application form, but I don't know the date of actual receipt by the town because the copy that I have was not date stamped. So we would want to complete that information. I also didn't have the dates of publication for the legal notice, but I know that those dates were both in January because the application was received in, in, I believe, in late December, and the public hearing opened in late January. So uh, the publication would have occurred in each of two successive weeks. Um, I believe I captured the dates of the public hearing. This one was a bit of a challenge, um, maybe more so than, than the usual, because in addition to sort of the routine continuances, we had uh, at least one continuance, maybe two continuances with no substantive testimony taken back in February because the applicant uh, wasn't ready to proceed. Uh, and then we had a series of uh, declared continuances under the, the special legislation that issued due to COVID-19. So um, I've, got, I've got those dates here and I've got a few footnotes that just reference um, that, that, that that's what occurred. Um, I've got relevant zoning bylaw sections, which is really just the use table and the special permit section, 2230 and 5300 respectively. Uh, date of the vote remains to be determined. And then outcome of the vote, again, the presumption is that it's an approval based upon my instruction, um, but we don't know yet uh, uh, who, who will motion and who will second and what the roll call will be. Uh, similarly, I didn't have the full attendance record. We don't yet know the voting record, but that information can be, can be completed. Uh, and that would be the record of proceedings. And then before we get to the really the substance of the decision, the last preliminary section we have is key documents. And again, different, different boards, commissions, committees do this differently with their, with their special permit or, or, or variance or site plan approvals. Um, but generally there is some, some uh, listing, some enumeration of the various documents that were received that become a part of the record of proceedings. Um, it's important to, uh, in my opinion, to document what is received and what has been relied upon by the board and making its decision uh, to assist uh, not only the board, but staff, future board members, future staff with what was uh, relied upon, what was intended, um, what was represented by an applicant to the board. Um, and so we, we have uh, blanks here. Um, some boards choose to, to excerpt this from the decision so as to reduce the bulk of the decision and include an exhibit A that has a listing of key documents if that listing uh, begins to become lengthy. So. Um, I will work with Jennifer to, to um, complete that list and, and it's up to the board as to whether you wanna incorporate it where I've put it or you'd like to move it elsewhere within the, within the decision document itself. So after we get through that preliminary, uh, those preliminary portions of the decision, we then get to the actual findings and decision itself. And so, as the title suggests, it's divided into two sections, findings of fact, and then a decision with conditions. So I have an introductory statement here that simply references, and again, I based this on my notes, but principally on the application materials that were submitted. Um, but I would obviously welcome a, a second or third or fourth pair of eyes to confirm the accuracy of what I've got here. But I have a description of the overall uh, size of the locus and its location, zoning district, um, I've got in quotes the use category into which this particular use falls, which is what necessitates the special permit from the Zoning Board of Appeals. And then I've got a, a quick one sentence summary that the applicant's proposal is to construct a uh, retail sales establishment, uh, 9,319 square foot establishment with associated site improvements on the locus. So that's just an introductory paragraph. It then continues on stating that the board grants the special permit, but then we get to the real, uh, the real substance of the uh, justification for issuing that special permit, the findings of fact. And um, this is not news to you, it's what we've spent the, the better part of the last couple of meetings on. It's what um, I've uh, advised the board you need to consider really from, from day one, from the opening of the public hearing, 
uh, Section 5320 and this standard that the proposed use of the locust must outweigh the detrimental impacts on the town and the neighborhood in view of the particular characteristics of the site and of the proposal in relation to that site. And then even more specifically, the six criteria that we've discussed in recent meetings from 5321 through 5326. And um, as we go through the decision, the, the, the bottom of page four, um, and I'll come back to this, but all of page five, and then a ways on to page six, I've just enumerated each of those six criteria and I've attempted to capture, and again, I can only do the best I can based upon my notes, my recollection, um, but I, I went back, I watched certain portions of meetings. Um, I look back at my notes, um, specifically from the last two meetings when the board itself uh, went through these criteria and, and, and member by member comments were made about why these criteria were believed to be satisfied or not satisfied. Um, this is an approval. And so again, on the presumption that the uh, vote will achieve the necessary supermajority, um, I didn't highlight the, uh, the, the comments made by members that would be in opposition that would, would um, determine that these, these standards were not satisfied because presumably that's not going to be the consensus of a supermajority of the board if you're issuing an approval as opposed to a denial. That's why I asked the question when I'm given instruction to, to, to create a decision well, what is it? Am I crafting an approval or denial? Because they're crafted very different ways. Um, I'm not going to provide grounds for denial and an approval decision, nor would I provide grounds for an approval in a denial decision. So um, all the grounds that I've cited to are really comments made by board members that were uh, supporting the satisfaction of these various criteria. It's paraphrased by me. Um, some of it is verbatim based upon my notes or based upon what was said at certain meetings. Um, but I'm, I'm obviously not quoting individual board members because, again, this is supposed to be a consensus. It's pretty clear in the law, whether it's here, whether it's on appeal, that no single board member's opinion uh, wins the day. It's, it's a supermajority vote of the board. It's a consensus amongst that supermajority that will dictate the outcome of these proceedings. So with that, I'm not going to read verbatim the next two pages of the decision. Um, I'm happy to uh, address individual criteria. If the, the board would like me to, I'm happy to respond. I know that Mr. Staberski indicated that he was hopeful I'd go through these findings and give uh, maybe the board an opportunity to ask questions or to make comments. And certainly I'm happy to, to take any feedback on these and to adjust the decision accordingly. It's your decision, not mine. This is just my first attempt to try and um, try and capture what, what uh, the sense of the board was um, from, from my perspective. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, John Stabersky. Yes. <clears throat> so, Mr. Costa, when you draft these findings of fact, are you looking for evidence to support the findings of fact, or are you just relying on the opinions of board members? Sure. So, through you, Mr. Chairman. So, the the presumption is that board members, and it's not always a safe presumption, but the presumption is that board members in fulfilling their obligations as uh, members of an elected or an appointed board and their statutory obligations, their obligations under the bylaw are engaging in a decision-making process based upon the evidence that's before them. So on occasion, there will be specific citations in a finding of fact to a report. Um, I think that I've done that in a couple of instances, cited to a report that might have been submitted by an applicant or peer reviewed by a, uh, a peer review consultant engaged if not by the ZBA, then maybe by the planning board, but representing the town's interests. Um, but it, it, it certainly is a combination of those facts as well as opinions of the board. But again, the, the presumption is, and I can't speak to this, I'm not a board member, I don't get a vote. The presumption is that opinions of board members are grounded in the facts. They're not just opinions that are given on a whim without any support. And are these facts, are facts that had to come before the board, the ZBA as evidence, or are they extra judicial facts? For example, like members going to the store, the Dollar General to see what kind of products they offer. So it, it's a combination of both. Uh, I would say uh, more heavily favoring the former and not the latter. It's an applicant's obligation and the law is clear in this regard, um, particularly with a, a, a tool like a special permit. It's the applicant's obligation to establish its entitlement to the special permit, that it has satisfied the standard. And so to that end, the applicant must present information 
uh, to support its satisfaction of the, the general standard in section 5320, and then the individual criteria in sections 5321 and fi through 5326. And the extent of evidence that's presented, uh, the extent of um, technical evidence versus opinion evidence, the extent to which uh, it can be expected that board members have a general understanding or sense as to whether something, uh, a criterion is satisfied or not, that differs from project to project. I mean, I've I've represented boards and I'm aware that boards all over the Commonwealth, zoning boards, planning boards, acting as special permit granting authorities, sometimes conduct hearings that last all of 15 minutes on simpler projects. Um, and they apply the six part test and they find that the st standards are satisfied. And in those instances, there aren't um, uh, pages and pages of technical reports and peer reviews, um, but then there are far more complex projects, projects like this one that's before you um, that, that uh, have un undergone more substantial, uh, more substantial permitting process and have submitted uh, more significant information. That information's been reviewed. And certainly I would suggest that, for example, on a topic like traffic, um, traffic is something, and the courts have said this, that is not generally within the everyday knowledge of a board member, um, as opposed to um, something like maybe community character, which may be more uh, within the everyday knowledge of a board member. Traffic has a, a technical component to it. So in the courts, anyway, um, the judges have looked to experts in opining with regard to traffic impacts more so than they have determined that there is an absolute necessity that there be um, a, 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 a planning consultant that give an opinion on uh, character of the neighborhood or consistency with the neighborhood. So it differs from criterion to criterion. So the, the reason why I asked those two questions to start out is the, the first uh, findings you had under 5321, which is the social, economic, and community needs. Um, the, I'm not sure the, what, is, what is stated partially in here is opinion that I don't think has been grounded in any facts that were ever before the board. And I'm really talking about the fact that the board finds the applicant's project will expand the offering of certain retail goods in Deerfield. Um, particularly this part, decades ago, multiple grocery stores operated in town and dry goods could easily be found. I would suggest, uh, and I don't, I don't think there's been any evidence before the board that that's the case. I know it was the opinion of Mr. Decker. I would, I would, think I would suggest that that is not an accurate statement because I think there's much more dry goods that are can be found in town now than there could have been decades ago between all of the stores, between the pharmacies, between Yankee Candle, between the general store, that that, that is not an accurate statement. It was just an opinion of one person. And I, and I don't think that's accurate. So that's why I'm kind of calling into question, how do you arrive at that? I know that that was said by Mr. Decker. I don't dispute that, but um, Mr. Chairman. as a basis, uh, I just don't see that, that to be true. Yeah, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Decker. Mr. I, Decker. I, Mr. Decker. I stand on my statement. Uh, John, you probably weren't living in town when uh, Solowicki's had their uh, dry goods store next to Chicks. Chicks. You could go in and buy ammunition. You could buy all kinds of, you could buy ammunition and chicks. You can get a hamburger and chicks. You could get lunch and chicks. Next door, Mrs. Selawicki, Helen's mother, ran the store and her brother was a cobbler out back. You could get a pair of jeans, t-shirts, anything you wanted within reason, not fancy stuff. Right now, I don't know where you can buy any of that in Deerfield of that type outside of the Deerfield Academy student store or at Eagle Brook or Vermont if they have one. But right. you're not going to buy that at Dollar General. You're not buying ammunition there. And you can well, get a hamburger at lots of places in town. I'm, I'm trying to emphasize the dry goods in particular, John. Like if what? you want a pair of jeans or you wanted socks or what have you, where do you buy them now? So I think we're wasting a lot of time. I said it and I still believe it. Uh, there were a lot of stores. I mean, you didn't grow up in the center of South Deerfield. Bat, you I grew up on North Main Street. That's pretty close. Yeah, well, what year did you move there? I've been in and out of this town since 19, in the 1960s. 
Uh, mm -hmm. You know, my and my uncles own some of the stores in the center of town that I used to patronize. So I, I uh, you know, and I have four generations of family going oh, back. So I know I, this. I'm familiar with your grandfather who used to be involved at uh, the high school. Okay. He did a very good job. Okay. And uh, he was there a number of years. But, but I, I know to... this town, Bob, and I've been around for, for a long time. And that, but and you, I'm 60. You, you, and that a lot of that stuff predates me. Yeah. All right. Well, there's no, no sense debating it. So, well, I'm so, the so, the fact, so, so I'm going to make, so uh, I think the, the line that I'm really concerned about decades ago, multiple grocery stores operate in town, dry could, could be easily found, but that is no more. Uh, I think that's an inaccurate statement. And, and I would move that that statement be struck from the opinion. Uh, comment. There was five grocery stores in town. There is none now. If you want to, those are uh, small convenience stores and the dry goods, they were there. Mr. Decker is correct that those uh, dry goods stores were there. Uh, I purchased things there myself when I was a young man and people used to come into town to do it. And um, they're not there now. That's a fact. But you can still buy those things in town. You can go to Yankee Candle and get a lot of those things. <clears throat> well, well, John, that's that's your opinion, and some of us beg to differ with you. Which is which is what a board's supposed to do. Yep. Okay. Any other comments? Okay, Mr. Costa. So, so, Mr. Chairman, I, I, I don't want to I, I don't want to control your meeting, but I, I think that Mr. Staberski. Uh, uh, phrased his question or his, his comment or his suggestion in the form of a motion. And so one, one thing that needs to be considered is as we deliberate a decision, so let me be clear because I'm not sure that I fully responded to, to Mr. Staberski's comment about um, the crafting of, of, these, of these findings of fact. Um, from, from an attorney's perspective, from a, the perspective of town council in crafting a, a permitting decision, be it a special permit or a site plan approval, the findings of fact are really the simplest for us because it, it, it doesn't require any legalese, it doesn't require any legal reasoning, it doesn't require the, 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 the creating crafting of conditions that might be enforceable. It, it's simply me reviewing the record and attempting to capture the, the consensus of the board as, as I understood it. And then of course, subject to me being told that I'm, I'm wrong or that more needs to be added or something needs to be subtracted. Um, it's not my opportunity. I don't, again, get a vote on the board, nor do I want one. Um, and so I, I, th these are not my words. These are sort of a compilation of comments from individual board members. What often happens is what Mr. Staberski has said, where when the draft decision gets before the board, something that one member said may, may, may not be agreeable to any of the other members. And so ultimately, if there are motions or there are discussions about individual findings, um, what matters is what a majority of the board is comfortable with. Ultimately, the, the full decision as a whole will be voted upon. And so somebody may, may lose a vote on a specific, specific finding, may lose a vote on a specific uh, condition that's put to a vote, but then may choose nonetheless, despite the fact that they haven't gotten everything they want in the decision, they may choose to vote in favor of the decision anyway when the final vote comes. But if, if there are motions to be made as we walk through these various findings of fact, I think we should achieve some consensus before we simply move on as to whether something is staying in or coming out. So what I would assume we're going to take, is there a motion? I moved. I made a motion. Do I have a second? There is no second. Am I allowed to make a second? No, you're not. Um, I think this was explained to you that um, you're an auxiliary member and we're only having our five members vote. Thank you. And the other question I had was, um, even if you did, did you watch all the meetings? Yes, actually I have watched all the meetings. Okay. Um, well, thank you. My only commentary would be, is that could we stick to the facts and not opinion in any um, Ma'am, that's all. Excuse me, we, you, you can't make any comments. Please, please. I know you have opinions, but 
we're no, limited. I understand. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay, uh, Mr. Costa. So are there, are there other comments or questions on the findings of fact? Yes, I'm going to go through the finding of facts and I have uh, lots of questions and comments on them. So I'll, I'll just, uh, unless somebody else wants to make a comment, uh, I defer to them, but I, I'm going to actually stay on this particular subsection 5321. So um, the other, the other uh, matter I wanted to bring up to you, Attorney Costa, is that I didn't hear or know of any evidence, and this is the last sentence in this line, that the same population, it's the last line of, uh, of 53, if you're 5321 section, the same population may also prefer the more manageable size of the proposed retail store, i.e. approximately 9319 square feet as compared to a 100,000 square foot or more super center or big box that can be more difficult to navigate. I didn't hear any senior citizens or any testimony of anybody before the ZBA that provided that factual underpinning. Uh, was, there, was there that or was that just the opinion of a member of a board member? So through you, Mr. Chair, I, I don't recall whether such information was ever submitted. Again, these findings of fact, for, for purposes of my crafting of the findings of fact, I, I didn't go through the record, nor, nor is it my responsibility as counsel to go through the record of proceedings. That's the responsibility of board members when they deliberate on the decision. So I went back to the deliberations to the extent that there was a reference in the deliberations to a study or a plan or a review. I did look back to make sure that that document or that reference existed or was accurate so that I wasn't misstating something. Um, so I did my due diligence in that regard. But generally, whether it's 5321 or any of the ensuing uh, special permit criteria, in each instance, this is a compilation of the remarks made by board members during the, the, the two nights of deliberations that were had in November and December. So can new information that was not put forth at the public hearing be cited as a basis uh, for a decision during the deliberations? No, no new information can enter into the record uh, from outside the board during the deliberation stage. Once the hearing is closed, the hearing is closed. So that's why I, I don't remember, and this is why I'm drawing this to your attention, I don't remember any testimony or any statements during the public hearing talking about the preferences of senior citizens to not shop at big box stores as opposed to uh, the applicant's proposed store. So that's, so, so I would move as a result that that sentence be struck from the opinion. Do I have a second? Denied. Um, you know something, Mr. Stodowski, you're not a judge. You don't deny motions. It's just there's no second. I'm sorry. Um, uh, I'm not a lawyer. And I expect that. But I have a question for Mr. Costa. Um, we have had we have had public comments. Not all comments came through public hearing. Um, and maybe this person was told by a member of the town, um, we're supposed to be a representative of a town and people have made us comments for and against um, what they wanna do. And uh, where's the place for this? Is there a place for it? Well, Mr. Chairman, I, I, think, I think your question is maybe just a different way of asking the question that Mr. Stabersky asked a bit earlier about fact versus opinion. Uh, there's there's a, a degree of both of those in the decision-making process. Um, I'm not sure that it is even possible to separate fully one from the other. Board members ex exercise a certain degree of discretion and their opinions uh, are involved in the, the task that they perform as a board member. Um, I do think that decisions are made stronger when they're grounded in facts. I do think, as I said before, that with respect to certain topics, I gave traffic 
uh, as an example, um, with respect to certain topics, <coughs> it's beneficial if there are um, tech, if there's technical data that supports a conclusion that's drawn by the board. But you know, I I, I can't I can't create the uh, facts to support an opinion. I'm just reflecting what was stated, and if if um, you know, looking to this particular sentence, that same population may also prefer the more manageable size. Um, it's not citing, it doesn't say that anybody said that. It uses the word may. This is a statement that was made by a board member. I don't remember which board member it was, but I, again, I, I pulled it from the deliberations. So I, I can't speak to whether it's true or false. I can't speak to whether um, it's supported by facts in the record, i.e. testimony given by a certain population or otherwise, I can't speak to that. Um, but I'm simply reflecting here what uh, one member said. And if the other members are, are not in agreement with that and don't think it's, it's appropriate, then certainly I would encourage you to strike it. Okay, thank you. Any more comments? Uh, I, I have additional comments on 5322, the uh, traffic flow and safety. Um, and, and to be frank with you, Mr. Costa, it kind of puts me at a disadvantage. I wish I'd have an opportunity to organize my thoughts and not have just 15 minutes to look this over uh, to talk about it. But I found another line that I thought was inconsistent with, uh, with what, our, what, our, uh, what, what evidence came before the public hearing. <clears throat> I don't, and, and I'm gonna go one, two, three, four lines down. It's the, it starts, the board finds the traffic flow and safety will not be compromised by the project. I don't think there was ever any finding or anybody ever stated that the traffic flow and safety will not be compromised. I think everybody agreed it would be compromised, but they're willing to accept the compromise. Am I, am, I, am I not stating the truth? Everybody knows there's gonna be more traffic. Everybody knows there's gonna be more cars turning in. Everybody knows that's one of the most dangerous intersections in town. Um, and, uh, and, and that although the, and I know you cited further on in this section about some of the mitigation efforts, but, that the, but the fact of the matter is it is gonna be compromised, but it's gonna be mitigated. So I don't, I don't think that's an accurate statement of the sentiment of, of the board. And as such, I would move that the phrase, the board finds that the traffic flow and safety will not be compromised by the project be stricken. Bernie. I don't hear, though I hear a second. No second. Okay, hearing no second, I'll, I'll continue on. Um, uh, at the very end of this particular section, um, and I'll read the phrase that I'm, that I'm, uh, looking at here and the board is satisfied that loading and unloading of commercial vehicles e.g. product deliveries waste disposal can occur without disruption of on-site traffic circulation um, you know I don't have a problem with the beginning of the sentence that there's sufficient parking um, but I, I don't I don't think anywhere that we had any that there was any discussion with respect to being satisfied with that. In the, but correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, the, did anybody remember making that remark in the, in the discussions? No, nope, hearing none. So I would move then that uh, the sentence uh, strike actually from and and the board is satisfied that loading and unloading of commercial vehicles, product deliveries, waste disposal can occur without disruption on traffic circulation. And I might add, uh, 
that, that I'll wait till there are there's a second or not. So we'll have a second. And and I assume I, I'm not going to second the motion, but we talked about it. Um, I did. We did talk about the trucks turning around with the parking area for sure. We definitely spoke about it, and we spoke. And that's also when I we, we Adam we, we talked Adam. I should say my name for the here with me. We also talked about. Um, if you see further down, um, our opinion to limiting the time of deliveries and Mr. Costa incorporated that in the decision. Right. And I know, and I made some emotions, I made some suggestions on some conditions, but this is, but this is a statement that is in opposite of the conditions that we are really not satisfied with a carte blanche loading, unloading, waste disposal, um and and we're and we're, we're gonna ask for a condition so this is really not a consistent statement with what our conditions are going to be and that there was a finding you know i know i by the board on this so that is my motion i i think it makes the opinion a little stronger but that's that uh, i'm sure there's not going to be a second but i wanted to make let the matter be heard is there a second? <laughs> okay, Mr. Costa. Can, oh, um, are you are you done with that one, John? Uh, with fifty three twenty two, I am. Yep. Okay. Um, uh, fifty three twenty four. I'm, and I have no problems with fifty three twenty three. Uh, fifty three twenty four. The neighborhood character and social structures and mm -hmm. and. And Mr. Costa, I'm going to ask another question before I even get into this. I, you know, you know, I was fairly passionate that I believe that this is incredibly inconsistent with the neighborhood character and social structure of this particular uh, uh, facility here. Um, is there an opportunity for board members to dissent or to uh, or to find different facts in in this forum? So um, through you, Mr. Chair, so um, th there's no provision in the law um, that allows for a dissent the way that there would be, for example, with a with a you know, decision of a court of law where you might have a dissenting of opinion of uh, certain certain judges from among a panel. Um, the, the law only speaks to uh, the, the quantum of vote required for approval. Um, and if that quantum of vote isn't achieved and there's no there's no approval, certainly a member who does not support a decision, um, you know, could, could choose not to vote on it, could choose to abstain, could choose to affirmatively vote no on it. Um, in terms of a, a but I, I've not generally seen any sort of a rationale or explanation. The one exception that I might make to that point is I've seen some boards, um, and I can't remember the last time that I was involved in this sort of a situation, but I have seen some boards in instances where, let's say this, there's an approval that is crafted, a simple approval for a special permit and the vote is three in favor and two opposed. That's an effective denial, even though it's a majority vote in favor, it doesn't attain the super majority vote. So in an effort to try and salvage the decision so it will survive appeal, I've seen a circumstance where uh, the couple of members who opposed, even though they're in the minority, will add something to the decision with the acquiescence of the three who were in favor um, in an effort to, to put something under the record as to why the effective result of the decision was a denial. Okay. So, um, one of the uh, statements in the neighborhood character, first of all, you know, I, there, there is almost nothing in this section that any of, of, of the folks who testified before our public hearings or things that I have said um, in this. I mean, it's, it's, and I know you have to say, I know you've said that you just are gonna present something that's gonna be uh, one-sided for approval, but <clears throat> there's some just picky and stuff. That the square footage of the proposed facility is a fraction of the locust site total area, um, isn't it? Fair to state that the that the site actually maxes out our 
our planning board um, kind of uh, criteria with respect to uh, pavement and building location and how much uh, can be done in the site? And is that an accurate statement if that's true? Is the question directed to me? No. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I know you, I do represent the planning board and I know you understand what, what they've been through. And, and I thought the, I thought their site plan approval that this site was pretty tight. Um, and although the building might be a fraction, all the facilities are, 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 are fairly close with respect to what the site can take. Sure. So um, through you, Mr. Chairman. So I, I would certainly not, again, I, I want to be sure, and, and I've heard Mr. Staberski, you, you refer a few times, and I think you're, you're doing it unintentionally, but referring to this as an opinion. Um, I want to just be very clear that what, what's before you, what's before the board is a decision of the board. It, it is not an opinion, certainly not an opinion of mine. That's not my role in the process. I'm not offering a legal opinion of any sort. Um, at least, and especially for purposes of the findings of fact, I am doing no more than rehashing what board members have deliberated amongst themselves. I've represented boards that have come to conclusions that would be very different, entirely different than maybe what I might do if I were in their shoes. But that's not my role as town council to decide what's good or, or bad for the town of Deerfield. So the, where, I, where I certainly draw the line, as I indicated before, is Number one, if there are references to documents in the record, plans or whatnot, I will, I will assure that those references are accurate because I think that that protects the board regardless of its position on the issue and its opinion on the project. And then number two, if there are statements that I know are blatantly false based upon the record, I would either not include them or I would bring it to the attention of the board that, well, even though the member is saying this, um, everything I've seen suggests otherwise. So this was a statement that, and I have to look through um, my notes here to see exactly who said it, but one of the board members had remarked when the deliberations were occurring specifically on this, this criteria in section 5324, one of the board members remarked on the fact that the, 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 the square footage or the footprint of building um, would be a fraction of the overall area of the locus, a small percentage, I think it was said. So maybe, maybe, maybe their language is, was even stronger than mine. And so I was simply, again, rehashing that, reflecting that in the finding. If, if any of these findings are inconsistent with what a majority and especially a super majority of this board thinks, I, I've got no pride of authorship here. So let me know and I'm happy to modify it. So far, I appreciate that, that you, Mr. Staberski, have uh, uh, opinions on these issues that might be counter to maybe the opinions of the remainder of the board and that's fine. So far, I, I haven't heard seconds to motions and I haven't been directed to make the changes. If I'm so directed, I'm happy to make them. I understand. So, uh, so you wouldn't, uh, you won't check the factual underpinnings of, uh, of a statement like this to see whether it's accurate or not. That's, is that kind of what you're, you're just taking what board members say and, and put it in? Generally so. I, I, I don't want to go so far as to say I won't check the factual underpinnings. I think that um, a quick look at the site, when you look at the square footage and the footprint of the facility itself, it is a fraction of the locus's total area. Now, how it's much- a true, fraction, Adam, yep. It's a true factual statement that I made and I stand behind. You know, I think we've moved past the debate stage here. Um, and, you know, I respect your opinion and what you're trying to do, John. I understand that's why you're on this board specifically to to uh go after this applicant i get that so I, I Adam, uh, that mr sokolowski i take personal offense to you suggesting that i don't know where you're getting your information or why you're making such an accusation uh, i've served on numerous boards in this town over my life here and uh, and for you to be casting dispersions into why I'm doing what I'm doing and looking at my motivation or whoever's motivation it might be, I think that's totally uncalled for, unprofessional and inappropriate. Uh, John, please, um, please be recognized by the chair so we don't get into this back and forth. We, we, this is not a contest. 
And, and well, I appreciate, excuse me, John, I know you have a point of view, but Adam had the floor. Let him finish, and then you can more than, you're more than welcome to make comments. But we can't talk over each other. That doesn't serve any purpose. We're, we're not in here to, as a contest. We're in here to pre present facts and, and to make a proper decision. And that's why I ask, please, please, please be recognized so that we don't talk over each other. Thank you. Well, uh, I, I, I'd be recognized. John, I, hang on I would ask we keep. John, Adam had the floor, please. Let him, let him finish. Uh, John. I, I sit here and listen to you attack what four members of the supermajority of this board have said and what Mr. Costas wrote up for the past hour, okay? I understand it's different from your opinion. I get that. And I stand behind my statement, okay? I'm not a Dollar General fan, but I'm a fairness fan. I'm not a popularity contest. And I think Mr. Costa here has put together a decision that meets the requirements. It also gives us, the, gives us the power to condition this. We can't let this go on forever and we can't let, the, let any applicant just do whatever they want without conditions. You, Mr. Staberski, did a great job in offering a lot of good opinions and a lot of strong conditions that are included in this approval. And it's time to move forward. Well, all I ask, Mr. Sucker, may I be recognized? Mr. Yes, Sucker? thanks. Thank you, John. Oh. All I ask from all my board fellow board members is that you keep to, don't make this personal. I am not making this personal uh, with with anybody else, but to but to be casting dispersions and making it personal is is really it, it's really a sad day. That's not the way we should be, you know, conducting our board business in town. You might not like my opinions and how I do things, but we all have a right to speak and handle ourselves the way we think is the best way to do it. So I'm sorry if that it, it does not please you, Mr. Sokolowski, but you know, we're, we're all entitled to our opinion. It's a free country and we're doing what the best we can. So I will move on to the last one then. Um, and that is the impacts to the natural environment, 5325. Um, I, I really, uh, and I'm sorry, uh, this is, I, I, I'm going to move to strike the first sentence that there's no adverse environmental impacts are known based on the record before the board. Um, I would move that that be stricken. I think the record is replete with adverse impacts. I think, as a matter of fact, even the applicant has said there are adverse impacts that they're trying to mitigate. So, um, so I, I think that's an inappropriate statement and I move it be stricken. Uh, do I have it? <coughs> do I have a second? I'd like to make a comment on this one. Um, I, I don't know how much control we really have over some of these things. Um, from my experience in the Conservation Commission, that's their that's their their specialty, and the stormwater issues, that's all dealt with by the Planning Board, and I, as a board member, feel uncomfortable um, making decisions for another board. They're the professionals, and um, we need to treat them as such. They spent a lot of time on this. They're the professionals, and. I leave it up to them to make the proper decisions on this. Um, I, I just feel uncomfortable in stepping on other boards' uh, opinions. I mean, I don't. I would hope they wouldn't do that to us, and I don't want to do that to them. But that's just my personal opinion. But I, I'm uncomfortable with going after other boards for their for their duties or lack of duties. There, such. Thank you. Well, uh, so uh, Bernie, does that mean, I mean, that's not what this opinion says that, that, I mean, I think we're not, this opinion is saying there's no ad, we're finding no adverse environmental impacts. I don't think that's the sentiment of what our board has said, <coughs> at least the majority, I think it's what you said that we don't want to, we want to defer this to another board. We don't want to decide the environmental impacts. 
Um, and, and if that's the case, if that's how we're trying to decide this, we shouldn't say something that is inaccurate. We're basically standing up and saying there's no environmental impact. That's not how this board tackled this issue. Uh, in my opinion, from what I've heard my fellow board members say. Um, so that's why I think that, that sentence is, is inappropriate. <coughs> and, and I have to say inaccurate too. So I would move that the sentence, no adverse environmental impacts are known based on the record now before the board. Do, um, do, I, have a, do I have a second? Okay, I guess we can move on. Uh, oh, Mr. Sokolowski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a question for Mr. Costa. The way I read it, I understand where John's coming from on that and you, Bernie, and I, maybe Mr. Costa can clarify it. I would say that there's no, there would be no adverse environmental impacts um, if or when the applicant meets the requirements of the other boards. I, I think I would just like some clarification. I feel as though no matter what happens on any site, there's impacts. I think that's kind of, you know, common sense that if someone builds a house, there's impacts. Does it, does it, does it need to be no adverse or no substantial adverse in environmental impacts, you know, when the applicant meets those things listed below? Um, Mr. Chair, I don't know if you could, Mr. Costa could answer that, but I, I do uh, understand why Mr. Stavursky brought that up in that specific language. And I'd like just a little bit of clarification before we move on. Through you, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Um, so the, the answer to your question is that the way that your bylaw is structured with an overarching standard followed by this, this sort of six part test or these six criteria. The criteria don't state that the board must find that there is no impact or no substantial impact, no adverse impact. It simply includes as a factor to be considered by the board, quote unquote, impacts on the natural environment. And so the board could conclude that there are no impacts. The board could conclude that there are significant impacts, but each and every one of them or most of them or many of them will be mitigated. The board could conclude that there are some minor impacts or that those impacts are not adverse impacts. They're just impacts that are consistent with any sort of development of a site that is not previously developed. So. It's really for the board to decide case by case, project by project, application by application, what the impacts are and how that factors into the analysis. So of course, as I've said a few times now, any of this language uh, with respect to any of these findings of fact, as we proceed to the conditions, any of the conditions can certainly be finesse. This was my first go at it based upon my review of the deliberations. And I tried, this was probably the most difficult of the six criteria because there was much general discussion about the issue of the natural environment. There was much generalized discussion about permitting before the Conservation Commission. There was much generalized discussion about stormwater and review by, by planning board. And then of course, as we got really into the deliberation stage, especially there was discussion about new information that um, has become known in the community, but that is not properly before the board because the public hearing is closed and the public hearing was not reopened. So I attempted as best I could to fashion a condition that acknowledged the need for those addition or, or, or a finding, I should say, that acknowledged the need for those additional approvals. And in fact, they, they are also, you'll, you'll see the same language appearing later in a condition and acknowledging a certain deference to the jurisdiction of these permitting authorities and then very explicitly saying at the end of 5325 that the, the decision was expressly conditioned upon receiving these approvals and that, that if as a result of these approvals or conditions of these approvals, 
the site needs to be altered, that this special permit needs to be amended. So I tried to work all of that in. I understand, and I'm not saying that I agree or disagree with it, I understand the basis for Mr. Straberski's objection to the first sentence. If that's an overstatement, if it's, if it's perceived to be an incorrect statement, if it needs to be said somewhat differently, we can finesse that statement if that's not the opinion of the board. Again, I tried to be careful in speaking to adverse environmental impacts and being in speaking to what was known on the record before the board as compared to what might be coming forward in, in, in weeks or months ahead. But if even that is a false statement in the opinion of the board, then we can modify it. So uh, there's a motion. I have a motion that, I mean, I don't think this is an accurate statement. Um, and, and I don't think it should stay. Uh, so I have moved it. Anybody want a second it or am I going to be the Lone Ranger again? John, can you restate your motion, please? Adam, sorry for the record. Yeah, I, I moved that the first sentence of 5325 specifically, no adverse environmental impacts are known based upon the record now before the board. I, I, uh, I move that that just be stricken. And then, and then it goes on, the board recognizes there are certain approvals. It's basically, if you strike that, a lot of the rest of the dicta in the, uh, in the findings is kind of like, okay, then I know this is what you guys think. I don't agree with you, but this is what you guys think that we're gonna let other boards, you know, weigh in on the impact to the, on the natural environment uh, and make those decisions. Um, uh, but I think it's, I think it's just so inaccurate. We can't say that. I'll second John's motion for discussion. Adam for a second. Thank you, Adam. Uh, Mr. Costa, with that line removed, is this still a lawful approval or should, or do you recommend some other type of language? Through you, Mr. Chairman, uh, it's absolutely a lawful approval. I mean, I, I've seen the most bare bones of decisions where literally the, the, the bylaws criteria are recited verbatim. There's some case law that says that that's bad practice and that that may not be sufficient to withstand a challenge, but the removal of a sentence of this sort, if it's believed to be false, in, in my mind does not compromise the decision. Yeah, I, Adam, again, I'm sorry for the note keeper. Uh, I mean, I agree just the letter, the word no, um, is strong. I mean, I think you put that with substantial or, you know, you know, the environmental impacts are don't, you know, the detriment doesn't outweigh the benefit as long as all these other conditions um, are, are met. Um, that's, that's where I stand on it. So do I hear a motion on this from somebody? Yeah. I mean, this is one motion. on the floor, right. sir. Okay, so but clarify what your motion is going to be Mr. so we know what we're voting on, John. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Before we vote, <clears throat> could uh, Mr. Costa craft uh, a, a change in the wording to basically say only minimum adverse environmental, right? We take the word out no and say put in something like minimally adverse impact adam again can i raise my hand yes i think if if uh I, if we take the whole sentence out then and the rest covers it then i th i think that that's that's fine i think i would support john's motion to take that whole sentence out based on the opinion that mr costa just gave us So I have, <coughs> I have a second to remove this. Is that correct? Yes, you Adam did. Kowalski seconded, okay. seconded John Staberski's motion. Okay. Call the question. Okay. Call the question. We're going to take a vote on this is um, 50, 5325. Remove first sentence.
think you can see that that's what the motion would do. Yes, okay. <coughs> okay. Um, uh, Mr. Decker. Um, yeah, I don't have any problem with it. Okay. Uh, so I'll vote for the motion, yes. Okay. Um, Alex. Yes. Um, Adam, yes. John, yes. Yes. So it carries, correct? So yes. Remove, can you remove it? Yes, removed. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, yes, John, question. Costa, uh, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm going to continue on. There's a, one other section in this. And, and you know, and, and I know, Mr. Costa, you're in a bind with this, but to have 20 minutes to review all this, to I mean, I know I've maybe been more loquacious than I needed to be, uh, but you really, I really haven't had a lot of time to think through what you've written. But I do have a question as to why in the last sentence of, of this particular section, impact on natural environment, that if the, if the information that we've been given is inaccurate or different, why is it an amendment as opposed to a new special permit? Because we have to go into a whole weighing, weighing all the factors once again when we, when we look at you know, what the real information is rather than what we have on, on record before us. So through you, Mr. Chairman? Yes. So I, I want to say two things, and before I answer the question, and I, I can certainly do that, um, you've remarked, Mr. Staberski, a, a few times, three or four now, on, on the, the brief period of time you've had to review the decision, and I, I appreciate that. I think I said at the start of the meeting that I understood that that is uh, inconvenient and unfair. Um, I want it to be very clear for the record that this is not a situation where I put this decision up this afternoon, and so it wasn't available to board members because it wasn't ready. Um, that's not the case at all. Um, this decision could not be circulated because of the requirements of the open meeting law prior to today's meeting. That's not my doing, that's the open meeting law's doing. So I appreciate the frustration and I appreciate the inconvenience of that. Um, it's not the first time I've had board members frustrated by that process. There are ways around it. Um, we had talked about those briefly. In fact, I reviewed um, because I understood that you made a request of the assistant town administrator to circulated decision in advance. And I, I spoke with her, consulted with her about her recollection of events. I actually reviewed portions of the last deliberation session to be sure that I didn't misremember things. And there was never an instruction to try to avail for the board to avail itself of one of the workarounds. The discussion was about conditions being sent to me by individual members, insufficient enough time for me to draft the decision for your next meeting. And, and that meeting was, was tonight. So Again, I apologize for the inconvenience. I just want it to be very clear in the record that it's not a circumstance where uh, there was an effort to get this to the board late to deprive you of some opportunity to review it fully. And quite the contrary, if the board's not prepared to act on this tonight because you need additional time, not only do you have an additional week to make that happen, but um, I've consulted with the applicant about tonight's continued proceedings. And I'm confident that if you needed additional few days, an additional week, that you would get that additional few days or an additional week from from the applicant. So I, I just put that out there so that it's very clear for the record how this came to be. With that said, on your specific question about amendment versus a new application, to, to some extent, if we're talking about the sorts of amendments, excuse me, the sorts of changes that could result from a conservation commission uh, issuance of an order of conditions or uh, the planning board's issuance of a stormwater permit or a, a site plan approval, um, it may be two sides of the same coin because the rule of thumb with respect to reviewing an amendment, typically when an applicant has received a special permit for a project, if that special permit is in hand, if the appeal period is passed, if that special permit has become final, an applicant is permitted, or a, a permittee, a recipient of a permit is permitted to amend that permit as opposed to seeking a whole new permit. It doesn't, what you call it doesn't matter so much the only difference typically between a new application and an amendment is that the scope of review is more limited on an amendment. It's limited to the aspects of the project that have changed. Sometimes so many aspects of the project that have, have changed that it is really one and the same with making a new application. 
Uh, most communities require a fee for an amendment, the same way that they require a fee for a new application. So in my mind, they're not that different. Typically, uh, special permits, variances, uh, site plan reviews provide a, an acknowledgement that there may be circumstances that would prompt that decision to be amended in the future and will often be very specific about the types of things that in the eyes of the board will mandate an amendment to the decision. And so that's why we have this here. Certainly the applicant could make a whole new special permit. And if there are wholesale changes to the project, it's gonna be the same thing. Uh, and Mr. Koss, with all due respect, I'm not trying to besmirch your reputation by this being late. I understand you're constrained, uh, but I, I wish I knew that we weren't going to get it beforehand. I, you know, I thought there would be a draft circulated and we'd see it and comment on it. But I, I don't recall you ever talking about any kind of workaround where we could do that. Uh, but I might have been mistaken, or maybe it was late. I didn't catch that. Uh, but that would have been helpful. I'll remember that for the next time. Um, so I have no other comments on the uh, findings of fact. Uh, um, and thank you. Mr. Chair, would you like me to proceed to the conditions of approval? Um, have we finished? Uh, we've got um, 20, 5326. Does anyone have any comments on that one? I'm taking that there are none. <coughs> um, does anyone think? Does anyone think we need a short uh, a recess for a few minutes? Or are we all set? Mr. Decker, you all set? He's shut off. I guess we're going to continue. I'm all set. Okay. I guess we'll continue, Mr. Costa. Okay. So um, the conditions of approval follow on the next four or five pages. There are um, really two types of conditions that are typical with special permit decisions. And I'm sure I'm not telling the board anything that uh, members don't already know. There are sort of standard conditions, uh, boilerplate conditions, routine conditions that uh, are often made a part, should be made a part of most any special permit that a board issues. And you don't, I don't think necessarily have those. Um, again, I created this form, but I've got standard conditions that I have uh, worked with the planning board to incorporate into some of its decisions. And many that I've worked into uh, dozens, probably hundreds of decisions I've crafted for other municipal boards over the years. So I attempted to work some of those standard conditions into this decision as a matter of, of, of uh, good practice. And so really condition number one is the perfect example. It's condition number one in virtually every, every decision that I draft on behalf of a municipal board. And it says that the project must be constructed in substantial conformance with the documents and plans that have been identified and that are on file with the board and on file with the town clerk, including but not limited to the application and the plans that have been made part of the application as they may have been revised through the permitting process. And then it goes on to say that the determination of substantial conformance is made by the board in its sole discretion and that any material deviation requires review by the board through an amendment of the approval. And so to give you a sense as to how this works, um, I, I actually uh, had occasion to deal with it just last night, a different municipal board I represent, the planning board in another community. Uh, there was a decision that was drafted. It actually was not one of mine, but it had this language in it uh, back in 2003. And there was a, a, a slight modification made to one of the buildings. And there was a question as to whether or not it required an amendment of the uh, special permit that the planning board issued. And so the applicant appeared before the board informally to ask if it was considered uh, in substantial conformance with the plans, or if it was considered a material deviation that necessitated a, a new application to the board to amend the special permit. Uh, and the board had the authority to make that and didn't make that determination. So that's really the objective here is to be certain that you get what you've bargained for, you, you get what's been represented to you, and that if there are changes to come, regardless of the source of those changes, that uh, the, the, the matter will come back before you first for determination as to whether the, the deviation is, is material. And then if it is, then it'll come back before you in the form of an official application for, for a special permit amendment with notice to, to, to parties in interest and public hearing and all the usual protections that are afforded by the statute. Comments? I have a comment. 
uh, any any material deviation shall require review. And then I listen. I look at John's comment. The special permit shall be revoked if there are any changes. Um, any when you when you put the word any material changes and all that, I think that leaves a lot of conjecture about what what is any. Um, that could be anything. I'm no lawyer, but I look at it and say, well, if you change where the sidewalk is, that's a change. If you change this, um, I think it's well covered in the first section. And to put that in there with a side note of shall be revoked means if there's any changes, we're going to revoke this. Is that what that says? No, no, Mr. Chairman. So I, 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 I should have maybe described because as we get into the conditions, you'll see that I've got these remarks that appear over in the in the in the yep. section of the page. And so this was my attempt. So I, I received numerous conditions from different board members and was asked to incorporate those conditions into the decision. And as I indicated before, in some instances they fit neatly into what I had already crafted uh, or or mimicked or mirrored some of my conditions. Uh, in other cases, the language was different. And I wanted to all that to be reflected. I didn't want any member to feel like their their comments, their requested conditions, didn't somehow make their way in in, in, in writing on onto or into this document. So, where something didn't quite fit, or where I opted for my language instead of a member's language, or I or I adjusted my language to address what a member requested, but not verbatim, I tried to provide some form of explanation. So my comment was simply saying that. Mr. Staberski included a recommended condition that if there is any change to the site plan from what was represented to the ZBA, the special permit shall be revoked. And my comment was simply that I think that my condition one captures the set, this, the, the reality that there is no right to proceed under the permit if there's a material deviation, um, there's a process required. And frankly, if there's something less than a material deviation, but nonetheless, something that is not in substantial conformance with the plans, there's an opportunity for the board to make that determination. So the language you see here, what is not in the margin is what I recommend. And I do think that the term any is important because it, it's, it's modified by the term material. It's, any, it's not just any deviation, it's any material deviation. And I would say that something like relocating a sidewalk would be a material deviation from what's been approved. That sidewalk could be relocated in such a way that it interferes potentially with on-site circulation. It could be relocated such that it interferes with the design of the stormwater management system. Or uh, so, so those sorts of deviations, while they may seem minor, often aren't. Other comments? Yes, uh, Mr. Chair? Yes. Mr. Uh, uh, John Staberski here. So, um, Mr. Costa, uh, I'm, you know, I, I understand the language you're using, and I know it's probably language that has been litigated and there's decisional law on what substantial conformance or material deviation means in the special permit field. Am I, am I right with that? Is it, is it a, is, is, are they terms of art that you know, we will know that if the building moves 10 feet, that's substantial or material, or it isn't substantial or material. It's kind of, you know, it, it's kind of, some of those words are what's in the eyes of the beholder. Um, so I'm trying to decide, I'm try, you know, I understand how you phrase this, and, and but I'm just looking for more guidance in terms of what these terms mean for us. I mean, any is easy. You know, you don't have shades of gray. This tells me there's gray. So through you, Mr. Chair, so, so you're right. And I'm gonna answer your question a couple of different ways. So on the one hand, no, there, there's, I mean, although these terms, there, there, have, there have been decisions that have, there have been court, court decisions uh, that have referenced special permits or site plan approvals that have used these terms, but they're not terms of art in the sense that they've been sanctioned by the courts. They're not terms of art in the sense that they're utilized in statute but they are tried and true in the sense that I've seen them in many decisions, not just decisions I've crafted, but decisions that other municipal council have crafted, other land use council have crafted. They are vague, there's no question about it. And they are intended to be vague. In fact, the, the fact that they are somewhat vague um, is, is uh, highlighted by the second sentence. The first sentence says that the project must be constructed in substantial conformance. 
well, what does that mean and who determines what's in substantial conformance? Certainly the applicant is gonna think that um, the, 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 the bar is much higher in terms of um, something being out of conformance than, than the, the board will. And so the second sentence says, the determination of substantial conformance is made by the board in its sole discretion. So the idea here really is to give the board as much authority as we reasonably can without being accused of not making a final definitive decision on the application that's before you as a board, as much discretion moving forward to have the ability to uh, review changes to this project if changes arise and to determine whether those changes necessitate the need for a new public hearing process, a new opportunity for residents to be heard and a formal amendment to the special permit. Mr. Costa, could I ask you, since I know this uh, special permit requires a super majority, what is the voting on, uh, on uh, determinations of substantial conformance, material deviation, and, and all that? Is that majority rule or is it the super majority? It's a majority rule, rule in determining what would be. So anything that's not, the, the reason that the special permit requires a super majority is because that's statutory. The default rule, as you probably know, is that a majority of a uh, public body is sufficient to take action on behalf of that public body. So in the absence of anything stated within the condition, um, this would be a simple majority vote, unless it was determined that the changes, that the deviation is material pursuant to this last sentence. Once it's determined to be material and it requires an amendment, an amendment to a special permit is treated the same way uh, under the statute um, as an original special permit, it requires that supermajority vote. So hearing that, Mr. Costa, uh, you know, and I don't know if other boards have ever done this, but given the sensitivity and particularly the uncertainty over the environmental concerns, that I would move that the determination of uh, material deviation or substantial conformance be made by a supermajority, that that the voting that the voting be changed from the general to have, and basic and that is basically because that's a the way I I perceive this is that is a fundamental decision on the viability of this of this special permit. Did did they comply with everything, and to have that be done by a just a simple majority as opposed to a super majority um, seems to be shifting um, you know, the authority to make fundamental decisions. So I don't know what my other, four, other board members say, but I would say I would add uh, somewhere in here that uh, decisions under uh, paragraph one be made by super, by super majority. Um, do I hear a second? I'll second it. Okay. Okay, <laughs> so maybe I'll just expand my thought process a little bit. And again, this is on the fly because I'm seeing this here Can, um, for the first you, time. Excuse uh, me, sorry. Can you state your name? Who said I will second it? Uh, my name is... My, my, oh, uh, uh, that was me, Alex Hershenretter. Okay. Uh, Thank you. John Staberski made the motion, and, and this is John Staberski. Um, so the way all, all the fundamental decisions, whether this permit gets voted on and, and approved is by supermajority. If there's going to be a change or uh, a change to the plan, I think the same voting percentages should apply to uh, decisions on changes. So if we have to decide whether there's material deviation or whether any of the changes are in substantial conformity, it should be the same voting percentages. It shouldn't shift because this is not, I don't see this as a procedural matter. And I think procedural matters are fine to, to be on a simple majority. Uh, but this is, uh, this is really kind of the essence of, uh, of the special permit. So I have a second. Um, any other comments? Adam Sokolowski, you have a question? Yes, Adam. I'm a little bit 
unclear of what Mr. Staberski's trying to accomplish here. I'm not. And is it legal to add a condition that changes how people normally do business? It would be my question for Mr. Costa. Um, I'm not necessarily against it per se, um, but this would be something down the road if the um, applicant had to come back. Is that's how I understand this correctly? So may, uh, may I, Mr. Chair? Yes. If uh, Adam said I'm a tough time following me and I'm sorry. Uh, so if the applicant, so the way I foresee this is if, if there is a question as to whether there is substantial conformance or a material deviation, I would see the applicant has to come back before the board and present their view as to whether there is either of those characteristics. So it would be kind of shifting the voting percentages if you decided on a, because we're deciding all this on a supermajority basis. I know where the votes are gonna be. We all know where the votes are gonna be. Um, but if you keep it a majority vote, then that changes, uh, it actually, I think it changes where, how this special permit's being determined. It's shifting, reverting back to a, an older or a, a standard that we're not using for granting this permit. Um, so well, I'm, I have another question. I mean, but if we put that in there, you might need four people to vote just to hear it. And that might be counterproductive. That that would be, be so, you know, if let's let's say because I, so I, I, I maybe we ought to ask think, Mr. Mr. I mean, because if you if you add that, I if you say like I mean, I think what you're trying to trying to accomplish, John, is if something is changed, then they need a super majority vote to change it, whether it's in the opinion of uh, if someone brings this to the board's attention, a board member or not. You would need four members just to hear it, and that might not be what you're trying to accomplish, and then a super majority to approve it. And that the governor just filed legislation to get rid of this super majority thing. So, I mean, I... Yeah. I took, uh, John Staberski, and I took a look at that legislation and maybe uh, maybe Mr. Costa can comment it. I don't think it applies to special permits like this, this kind of special permit. It does apply to some special permits, but not this kind. Now, I'm not sure by a super majority vote is, is in the right place and all that, but what I'm trying to accomplish is that if the applicant makes a change. In order for that change to be approved, it has to be approved by a supermajority vote. So I think it needs a little more language and you know, I'm, I haven't done the draftsmanship on it, but that, that's what I'm thinking. If there's a change for this permit to be valid, it, everything has to be by supermajority vote uh, rather than it reverting to just a simple majority. Mr. Costa, comment. Um, yes. So, so the the obvious intention of this condition, if if you've got an applicant, a permit recipient, that is proceeding with its project, and is uh, has determined that the project are not going to comply strictly with the letter of the approval that it received. Some applicants, some some permit recipients, will simply proceed with their project. Um, that puts the municipality in a difficult position. That the applicant may say, "Well, listen, any any change I make, the second I second I walk through the door at the at, at, at town offices and um, seek the opinion of the, the the permitting authority, whether it be planning board or zoning board of appeals, I've got to go through a special permit process that requires notice to abutters." It, uh, and other parties in interest, it requires a, a public hearing and uh, notice of that public hearing and publication. And so some applicants will just proceed with their project and it puts the town in a position where 
the town has to determine how to enforce its decision. That enforcement typically falls to the building inspector. And the building inspector then has to go down to the project site, has to issue a cease and desist order, um, and, and, and engage in an enforcement of the decision against the permit recipient. The objective of this condition, I mean, if an applicant's going to ignore the conditions of approval, enforcement's a whole separate topic. But I'm, 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 I'm proposing this condition, and I've consistently proposed it, to provide a mechanism. It's a mechanism that doesn't, isn't addressed statute, it's not addressed in your bylaw, it's not addressed elsewhere, to allow an applicant that has, that recognizes that certain minor deviations need to be made to its plan. Something that rises maybe a bit a lot above a field change, field changes are typically made with a quick sign off by the building inspector, something that maybe rises a bit above a field change, but that isn't something that is so meaningful that it would typically require all of the procedural and substantive protections of a public hearing process. That applicant can instead come before the board and say, I need you to determine whether this change is in substantial conformance, substantially consistent with the plans you already approved. And you look at it and say, oh, okay, you wanna, um, you, you, you hit some ledge, you wanna shift the building a foot in this direction, and you've also tweaked your architecture a little bit and so, you're eliminating the bump out over here and you're adding a bump out over there, but it's still within the footprint of what existed before. It's probably something more than a field change, but it's, it, it may not be enough to necessitate all that's involved in a new public hearing. This condition gives the board the ability to make that determination in its discretion. And so typically that determination as a matter of common law would be made by the board acting as it would act on any other matter that comes before it that's not governed strictly by statute. And when that's the case, it acts by majority vote. I think the proposal, and I don't want to speak for Mr. Staberski, but I think the proposal, and I'm trying to work the language here, is to require for purposes of the board determining that a project change is indeed in substantial conformance and does not require a new public hearing, require a super majority vote of the board. If that supermajority vote can't be attained, if a supermajority doesn't determine that, yeah, it's okay for you to do this, this is in substantial conformance, you, we don't need the same procedural and substantive protections. If it's only a three to two vote in favor of deeming it in substantial conformance, then it's considered a material deviation and the applicant has to, the, 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 the permit recipient has to make a new application for an amendment to the, to the special permit. Um, to make I have a question. question. I do think that that is, it is within your purview to determine the quantum of vote here because this is not something that's regulated by statute. This is a process you're creating by way of a permit condition. Okay, that was the question I was going to have is right now it's a simple majority, correct? The way that I've written it without these red line changes. Okay. Majority. Now, if we vote on this, do we leave ourselves open to litigation afterwards saying, well, we made changes in this? Does the board have the right to make the change of what its voting statutes are going to be <coughs> legally? So, 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 so my, my opinion here on the spot without having researched changing quantum of vote in a permit condition is that yes, you have that authority in a condition that is not otherwise governed by statute. You don't even have any obligation to provide an applicant with the ability to avail itself of this substantial conformance process. It's procedural, it's meant to um, to, to uh, simplify what would otherwise be potentially an application made for every minor change um, for a full special permit public hearing, et cetera. So I think that you do have the, the ability to do this. Does that mean that you know, you're not gonna get challenged? Frankly, I think if, there's a, if an issue arises with respect to what is and is not in substantial conformance and the board is insisting upon something coming back before it for, I, I think you're, you're, that, that case is likely to be litigated anyway. So. I can't promise you no exposure. I can't promise you no lawsuit. No attorney can, but I don't have, you know, th this this sort of a change won't keep me up tonight. Okay. Any other comments? Uh, uh, Adam Sokolowski. Yeah, I, I'm thinking that, um, I'm, you know, as a matter of policy, I think the supermajority is a, is a tough, is a tough one for a lot of situations. And I don't, I don't support having it here. I think um, not in this paragraph. 
Okay, do we do we have a motion to bring this to a vote? Oh, Mr. John, you made a, you, Mr. John Chair. made a motion, we had a second, so we're up for a vote. If you would like, Mr. Chair, if there's no other discussion. I, I think we need to bring it to a vote. Okay, so a yes vote is going to give us the super majority, am I correct? Yes. Okay, so if you vote yes, it means you're in favor of the super majority. <coughs> Okay, uh, Mr. Decker. No. Um, Alex. No. Um, me. No. Uh, Adam. No. John. Yes. Okay. <laughs> it's a <coughs> four to one. Um, four no's, one yes. So I believe it's the right terminology is not carried. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chair. Start? Yes. Uh, this is Alex. Uh, do you think we could take a five minute break? Um, or, I think or two or two minute. Make it five minutes. Is that a problem with any, for anybody? Good idea. Okay. Thank you. If we're going to take a five minute break. We're gonna uh, no. We're gonna meet at uh, about twelve after uh, eight. We are we ready to continue to the next um, number two? Okay, I think so. So, um, so Mr. Chairman, in an effort to, and I, I certainly don't want to rush through anything that board members want to discuss. But when I see a when I see a condition that doesn't have any remarks in the margin and is fairly uh, typical. I'm, I'm just going to uh, tell you what it is, and then I'm going to move on unless I get interrupted. So um, feel free to interrupt me, but I'll, I'll, the next few, I think, are just relatively straightforward. A couple of them, um, in fact, uh, yeah, two of the next three were suggested by, by, by members of the board. So condition two, simply, and, and this is a standard condition in most every decision, and typically it's condition number two. It, it says what the project is, and it says that the project is limited to what's been represented. So that's what it says here. It's, it's the retail sales establishment that's been shown and the associated site improvements that's been shown on the documents and plans that are referenced above. And again, we've got, we've got those listed on the first page with latest revision dates um, uh, and uh, with an with a, uh, explanation of what each sheet is entitled. So there's a great degree of detail there. So uh, future, future board members and future staff members will understand what it is that's been approved. Uh, condition three is one that um, a couple of members had made mention of, which is uh, uh, limiting or, or, or prohibiting outside sales, I should say, um, except for the storage of um, propane tanks. And I added a little bit of detail here in terms of what I thought was intended, uh, which are um, pre-filled propane tanks. I think one of the members said it would be a propane tank exchange um, I know sometimes those, uh, those locked up pre-filled tanks, they don't necessarily need to be exchanged. They can be purchased for a higher price. So I've got purchase or exchange, but it is pre-filled as opposed to a, you know, a, 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 a larger propane uh, storage tank on site that will, will um, manually fill your tanks. That's not, I don't think, what was proposed. So with the exception of pre-filled propane tanks for purchase or exchange, there shall be no outside sales nor uh, any outside storage or display of merchandise permitted on the locus. And further, the propane tank storage shall not be visible from any adjacent public way. Uh, condition four, again, is something that was requested by a board member. I know that there was some discussion during one of the sessions of the public hearing. I, I, I didn't come across it in, in listening to some of the, uh, or watching some of the videos. So I don't recall when it was said, but I, uh, there was a reference in my, one of my meeting notes um, to uh, an interest in a bike rack um, being installed. So one of the members suggested that there, there be a requirement that one be installed or near the entrance. My recollection is that the applicant may not have agreed to that. Um, I, I certainly could be confusing discussions that were had in the context of the planning board proceedings in which I've been involved as well. Um, but, um, you know, I, bike racks are, are not terribly 
costly, and uh, I, I don't presume that this is the sort of condition that um, would, would, you know, risk an appeal of the decision simply on the basis that you've required a bicycle rack. So, again, condition that's here simply because it's here doesn't mean it needs to be accepted. I want to make that very clear. Part of the challenge in accepting conditions, me accepting conditions from various board members and incorporating them into one document is that you may see something here that is really the request of one member that the other four members may not be supportive of. So certainly please do interrupt me, speak up if any of these conditions are conditions that uh, members don't, don't support. Um, condition five is another one that uh, we would typically have something and I, I had a bit of a boilerplate uh, trash disposal condition. I actually scrapped my condition altogether and rewrote something based upon proposed conditions from several members. So what I've got is that all trash shall be stored in closed, secure receptacles or dumpsters. Um, one of the members indicated that um, there should be a requirement that they be shielded or screened from public ways, but the plans already show where these, where these dumpsters are going to go and they actually already show them within an enclosure. And there's a detail for that enclosure on the plans themselves. So I've referenced the enclosure uh, and, but I've also said sort of a belt and suspenders approach that um, they shall also not be visible from adjacent public ways or from nearby properties. And then there's a, the second sentence is something that was a, a proposal from one of the members in the event that on-site trash storage attracts vermin or other animals, the applicant shall undertake uh, immediate action to remedy the same. So, um, so that's, that's in there too. Um, condition six is a landscaping condition, and it's a um, maybe comprehensive isn't the right word. It's only a, a couple, few sentences, a couple of sentences, but it addresses a, a few different things. So um, the first sentence is a simple one. All, all landscaping shall be in accordance with the landscaping plan that's been submitted to the board. Um, the second sentence, for so long as the facility is operational, the applicant shall maintain the landscaping in a sightly condition and shall perform regular lawn and property maintenance, whether or not the facility is operational and whether or not the building on the site is occupied. That last piece uh, after the semicolon is uh, something that a member suggested. Um, another member suggested that there should be, you know, some assurance in terms of uh, landscaping longer term maintenance. And so I actually stole something and, and modified it a bit from a decision I did a few years ago on a project where landscaping was a, a great concern that if the landscaping shall die, whether it's due to drought conditions or improper care or really for any other reason, it shall be promptly replaced by the applicant. Um, and then I, I was careful with my language here. I said with the same or an equivalent species of the same or comparable size, and then I have in parentheses or so great a size as is routinely available from local nursery stock. And the reason for the parenthetical is, you know, what happens if um, there, there is a tree, let's say, uh, proposed as part of the landscaping and that tree grows at, you know, uh, two feet a year and it needs to be replaced in 12 years. Well, you got a 24 foot tree. Good luck finding yourself um, at, at any reasonable cost or even finding, you know, at any cost a 24 foot tree of that species of, or equivalent species, that may be difficult to do. You might find a 12 footer, you might find a 14 footer. And so the, the parenthetical is meant to just recognize that availability is an issue. Um, so that's what I've got for condition six. I do have a comment here that member Hershenrutter had uh, recommended a condition that requires quote, additional screening slash tree line on the northwestern property line between the RA and the C2 zoning districts. And um, there, wasn't, there wasn't really enough specificity there for me to know if, if that proposal is for something more than what has been presented already. We do have a landscaping plan that shows screening in that general location. Um, I don't know if uh, uh, Alex was suggesting that there, there maybe needs to be additional screening beyond what's proposed, but I did wanna make reference to this in the margin and sort of open it up to him and to the board as to whether we've captured uh, your concerns with regard to uh, short and long-term maintenance of landscaping uh, extensively enough. Alex? Uh, I, yeah, I can comment on that. Yep. Um, this, is, this is Alex. Um, I think at the time it may have not been the, the best time to bring that particular 
uh, item up. Um, I, I think what you wrote is great. Um, I, I think at this point, the ship has kind of sailed in terms of trying to design something. <laughs> um, I think we're a little past that. Um, at the time, I was thinking just uh, from some of the feedback from the abutters, maybe trying to um, implement you know, a hard defining line between yeah, um, <clears throat> the residential zone and the commercial zone property. And maybe that would make the project more palatable uh, for them at the time. Um, and uh, I, don't, I don't think I really brought it up and discussed it anymore. So um, I think what you've written is great. Um, I, don't, I don't think we need to make it a hard uh, condition um, I think just because we haven't really had a chance to discuss it with the applicant. And again, we can't do that <laughs> right now. So um, I'm cool. Thank you for trying to incorporate that. Appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Chair? Yes, John. Uh, John Staberski here. Um, I have a question about one of the clauses in this paragraph. And it is the first clause of the second sentence. Um, it, it reads uh, for as so long as a facility is operational, but it kind of conflicts. So first of all, I think that should be deleted because I think whether it is operational or not, the applicant needs to maintain that property to look as good as possible. I also think it conflicts with uh, another clause a little further down in that sentence whether or not the facility is operational. Um, so at one point you say for, for as long as it's operational and then whether or not it's operational. So I, I think we should just delete that unless Mr. Costa, there's a real reason for as long as the facility is operational, they have to maintain the land. Mr. Decker. John, you're free. You're frozen. I'm frozen. Or you, were, just... you were frozen for a second. So okay. do I need to repeat myself? I would repeat the last few seconds. Okay. So I, I believe there's conflicting language in this sentence to how long or whether the applicant would have to maintain the landscaping if it, if the premises was not operational because there's a qualifier at the very beginning of the second sentence it says for so long as a facility is operational. Um, I think that the applicant should maintain the landscaping, whether it's operational or not, or for as long as they own it. So I, you know, anybody have any other thoughts on it or should I make a motion? I think Mr. Decker had a comment, but I didn't. He didn't come back. No, I didn't. Oh, I didn't, didn't have any comment. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. You can so, make. So, a, I would make a motion, John. So I'll make a motion to uh, to redact or delete the 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 clause for so long as a facility is operational, and then uh, capitalize the the, and the applicant shall maintain landscaping in a sightly <laughs> condition. <laughs> Uh, Adam Sikolowski, I'll yes, second okay. that motion. Okay, we have a second. Okay, let's um. <laughs> so, we're do we have a motion to delete? Are you gonna, um, Mr. Chairman? I I think I've shown what was just explained there. Deleting the first the first phrase prior to the comma, capitalizing the and then. Um, just uh, clarifying that it's all landscaping to be maintained in the sightly condition uh, without the qualifier. Okay. Um, we can, can, we, <coughs> can we have a vote on that? So the, the motion is to delete this. A, vote, a yes vote means we're going to delete this from um, section six. Yes. Okay. Mr. Decker, yes. Uh, Adam Sokolowski. Yes. I vote yes. Uh, Alex? Yes. And John? Yes. Unanimously approved. Um, please remove that. 
Mr. Costa. We all set. Mr. Chair, may I ask Mr. Costa one additional question yes. on this, uh, this particular condition? Uh, and that, Mrs. John Staberski again. Uh, how does one enforce such a clause? Through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so, you know, enforcement with any permit condition is sort of the, the million dollar question, and it, it, it can be evasive. Um, there are provisions, um, combination of the, the uh, Zoning Act, your zoning bylaw, that vests certain powers, and I, I think we've had these discussions before, maybe in other contexts, uh, vest certain powers in the building inspector um, as the agent of the, the Zoning Board of Appeals with respect to special permits. There's case law that says special permits effectively operate as the zoning that applies to a particular project or a particular site. And so it becomes enforceable, that permit, as would the zoning bylaw. And the zoning bylaw is enforceable through the building official under, under Chapter 40A. So that enforcement typically means the issuance of some form of cease and desist order. And uh, should the applicant fail to comply with the condition, um, there, there can be non-criminal disposition is authorized, and I do believe you have a provision in your zoning bylaw that does authorize it. You can engage in non-criminal disposition, which is a ticketing process, uh, or you can avail yourself of any of the rights available statutorily, either by bringing an action in district court, uh, housing court, or superior court to enforce the condition um, and to enforce the cease and desist order. Um, generally, those those processes are, I would say, rather successful, more so early on. Either typically you, 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 you either have an, an actor with whom you're dealing that is uh, prepared immediately upon receiving a cease and desist or receiving notice of a forthcoming cease and desist to bring their property into compliance, or you have one that, that isn't, sometimes you're in for a longer fight in those instances. Certainly, and, and this is where the operational language comes in, it becomes a, a more significant challenge in a circumstance where you have a, a vacant site, a facility that is non-operational. You can have a condition attached to a special permit that says you've got to maintain the site in the, in the sightly condition, but if the special permit is not being utilized, you can threaten to issue a cease and desist, but that's not that all, mean, not all that meaningful when there's nothing to cease and desist. So that's the, that's the conundrum I was thinking through, uh, Attorney Costa. And the reason why I asked that question was whether we, want, whether we can't, would like to and whether we can put uh, some other kind of enforcement provision in, in this or other conditions. For example, make them subject to a fine of a certain amount of dollars a day or a month or a week or... Uh, so that if, uh, if, for example, we have an empty uh, box there that is degrading and we fine them $1,000 a day, that the town can eventually take it by, for failing to pay the, pay the fines and we own it, the town owns it and can remedy whatever unsightliness there might be there. I'm trying to think of a better, I, you know, I'm familiar with how squirrely enforcing zoning violations is for absentee property owners. So I was just kind of trying to think of a, whether there's something we can put in here that, that would uh, have, have more teeth. So through you, Mr. Chair. So there, there certainly are mechanisms um, that, that can address the, the issue that you raise, ab abandoned buildings, buildings that have fallen into disrepair, um, the mechanism to do that is typically a, a bylaw, and a number of communities have these bylaws that are tailored toward these, th those, those sorts of buildings, those sorts of properties. Um, and there is, there is authority, general statutory authority, to adopt bylaws to that end. It, it becomes more challenging in the context of a discussion that we're having now because there is no statutory authority for a, 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 a municipal board, a zoning board of appeals, to establish a, a finding process as part of a permit condition. You've, you've got a site to the, you know, on what grounds are you doing that? You've got the authority under the Zoning Act to impose fines threat in the non-criminal disposition process. But in terms of creating something that would be, let's say, particular to the property owner, and that would be, you know, even if you could craft something, 
what, when the, the property ceases to be used for the purpose for which the special permit is issued, it is difficult to even attempt to enforce the conditions of that special permit because the special permit is not being utilized any longer. It would seem to be a covenant that runs with the land. If it's not being exercised, the conditions of that exercise don't necessarily apply. So again, there are ways to address it and some communities have, but it's very difficult to do you know, wh while you're in the midst of it in, in the context of a, a permitting process. Very well, sorry, I, I, I get it. I drop my comment and understand the complexities. With that, Mr. Chair, I'll move on to condition seven if there aren't any questions on six. Thank you, I guess you can move on. So condition seven addresses the fencing. And again, I've opted to sort of address this you know, not only by um, incorporating some language that was suggested by a member, but expanding on, upon it a bit and being, incorporating by reference to the plans that have been approved or, or will be approved. So uh, it says that the fencing that's proposed by the applicant, which is identified has the pr proposed six foot high privacy fence shall be erected and likewise maintained in a sightly condition, both as visible from the locus and as seen from neighboring properties throughout the life of the project. Maintenance shall include, but not be limited to regular cleaning, staining or painting, routine repairs, and as necessary replacement of all or portions thereof from time to time. So again, that's a bit more comprehensive than what I got via email, but uh, I've had some personal experiences with many of these conditions, but specifically this fencing condition and uh, fencing that is erected and might be slightly from the site, but is left uh, in a state of disrepair on the other side of the fence, so to speak, where, where the neighbors have to stare at it. Um, I've had issues with maintenance not being performed or fences falling down and, um, you know, uh, applicants arguing that, well, until it's, until it's physically, you know, on the ground, horizontal to the ground, it, it, it's still up and they're still in compliance with their permit. So um, the, the, the objective here is to avoid that sort of a circumstance. Um, condition eight addresses uh, a few different things and it's uh, somewhat of a standard condition, but I've tailored it a bit to apply to this project and in, in, in to the town of Deerfield. So uh, it says lighting, signage and pavement markings um, and those three things are all part of the, the proposal, shall in all respects be in accordance with the plan submitted to the board and otherwise shall fully comply with applicable bylaws, rules, and regulations and with the decisions of other permitting authorities. It then says in the second sentence, the applicant shall comply with signage restrictions applicable to properties within the commercial zoning district per section 222 of the zoning bylaw and then I added this, this sentence or this phrase after the semicolon, and the within special permit shall not be deemed to grant relief therefrom. And really what I'm trying to get at there is, uh, member Sokolowski commented that, or, or recommended a condition that um, the ZBA must um, uh, review or approve sign proposal. And um, the challenge with that is, as I review section 3200 and specifically section 3222, which deals with signage in the commercial zoning district, there are certain types of signage that is permitted by right. In fact, a, a number of different types of signage that's permitted by right. There is then additional relief that can be granted in the form of a special permit from the Zoning Board of Appeals. So I wanted to try and highlight that, that dichotomy that if, if there's something that's permitted by right, I'm not sure that the board has the authority. In fact, I, I, I'll say it's more strongly than that, the board doesn't have the authority to require a special permit where the bylaw doesn't. But at the same time, I don't want this decision to be read as well. We got a special permit and we did say, you know, we did put a little asterisk where we were going to install a sign. And even though that sign is of such a size that it would require a special, a separate special permit, we're not going to go get one. Uh, that's not what we're doing here. So that's what I attempted to incorporate and in, in, in encompass in Condition number eight. Mr. Chair? Yes. Mr. Sokolowski, if I could be recognized. I think what Mr. Costa did to incorporate that works for me. I understand where he's coming from on that situation to be in accordance with the law. Well, thank you, Mr. Sokolowski. Any other comments? Okay. All right, so Costa. condition. 
Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So condition nine addresses the offsite improvements. And as you know, there is a there has been a proposal to perform certain offsite improvements. And I, I believe, although again, this is a circumstance where I'm gonna defer to, um, to, to, to Ms. Gannett and um, we can fine tune this as we work toward a, a document that is to be signed. I believe that the July 28th, 2020 revised conceptual improvement plan is the latest version of proposed improvements to the adjacent roadway, essentially route, route, route five and 10, uh, as well as to the intersection. Um, I believe that that's the latest version of what's been proposed by the applicant. And so we need to find a way um, because that's not part of the permit uh, set and because it's not part of the locus at all, we need to very expressly, very explicitly incorporate as a condition, a requirement that those improvements be completed. And so I've, I've identified those here. The improvements include, but are not necessarily limited to what's shown on that plan. Roadway widening in coordination with MassDOT, uh, dedicated turning lane on five and 10, relocation of the site entrance and exit further from the nearby intersection as shown on the plans, uh, intersection lighting, improved signage and pavement markings. All of those were shown on that revised conceptual improvement plan. So, um, so that's there. The only thing I didn't add this condition, and maybe I should have added it and left a blank for it, but I'm going to raise it now, is there's nothing here, and I don't think there was ever a discussion had with the applicant, to my recollection, concerning the timing of these improvements, when these improvements get completed. And I recognize that it, timing is subject to a uh, approval process uh, with MassDOT, uh, and presumably a review by MassDOT. But uh, in my experience, conditions of this sort usually have a deadline. Um, that is tied to uh, a, a certain certain stage in the, the construction process or certain other benchmark. Issuance of a building permit, issuance of a certificate of occupancy might be the norm for something like this where it's um, improvements that are deemed to be necessary before the facility begins to operate. So I might suggest that there be an additional sentence added at the end that provides that deadline, but what that deadline is, I, I, I defer to the board regarding that. Mr. Chair? Yes. John? I would uh, suggest that, that, that those need to be done before there's a certificate of occupancy issued by the town. I think that's the, uh, that would be the proper demarcation that if they can't get that done, they shouldn't operate because they're telling us that's what's going to make the traffic and in intersection safer. If they can't make it safer, they shouldn't. They shouldn't be open. So I would move that where you think, yeah, Mr. Costa, where you think it should go uh, should be completed, shall be completed prior to the issuance of a certificate of occupancy. Yeah, perfect language. Uh, Mr. Sokolowski. I would tend to agree with that, but I don't know if we should go further to say that it should be done prior to construction. Um, I mean, I, I'll support what Mr. Stabersky has, but, you know, construction traffic might be busy. That's, I'll, I'll support what Mr. Stabersky proposed. Uh, proposed. Well, Adam, I, I think, uh, I think you're, your thought is even better than mine. Um, so I would withdraw my motion and maybe say prior to prior to the commencement, maybe prior to the issuance of a building permit. I don't have a problem except for one thing. They're dealing with the state. And uh, oh, well, I, I'm sorry to cut you off, Bernie, but yeah. when they start, when they start to build, in my experience with these projects, they usually go pretty quick. So you're, so you're saying the state will come around quickly? Is that what you're telling me? No, but I mean, I don't think a developer is going to sit with a vacant building waiting for the state either, because, you know, the state's a little bit quicker when you're paying. Okay. All right. So I, I just think that, you know, if you're going to be improving the intersections, improving turning lanes, they should do it prior to to construction. Okay. You answered my question then. Thank you. Any other comments? So Adam, question. Mr. Decker. 
Adam making that a motion? I, I can after discussion, if, if we want, I will. Well, I can agree with you, just make the motion. Okay, I'll make the motion um, that the Mr. Costa uh, type in the change on condition nine, offsite improvements shall be completed prior to the issuance of a building permit for the project period. And Second. I'll be seconded. Seconded by Mr. Decker, I think for the record. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to write this down just because I have to have a record of it myself. Okay, so we're voting for Mr. Costa, Attorney Costa, to add the terminology. It must be completed before an issuance of. Is that am I correct? Yes, you're correct. It, it is on the screen. I can restate it for you, Mr. Chairman. Offsite improvement shall be completed prior to the issuance of a building permit for the project. Okay, we have that for the record. So a yes vote means that we're gonna add this to the conditions. Any questions? Okay, let's take a vote, Mr. Decker. Yes. Um, Adam. Yes. yes. Um, I vote yes. Alex. Yes. And John. Yes. Unanimously decision uh, carries. So, Mr. Costa, uh, I think you can do that for us. Yes. Thank you. All right. So, um, moving on to condition 10. Condition 10 addresses signage. Um, there would typically be uh, some sort of a condition that addresses signage. Typically, it's limited to illumination. Um, uh, Mr. Staberski had suggested a statement that says that there shall be no signage located beyond the boundaries of the site. I, I, I'm reading between the lines here, Mr. Staberski, but I, I presume that maybe your focus was on the adjacent mass dot um, land that uh, provides a buffer between the uh, Route 5 and 10 and, and the site. Um, I just wanted to be clear, so I tweaked it a little bit, that we're not restricting or conflicting with the previous condition that actually requires some offsite improvements, which include signage. Um, in the roadway or adjacent to the roadway. So I've simply said that signage identifying the retail establishment, um, for example, you know, owner, applicant, tenant, document, uh, shall not be placed outside the boundaries of the locus. Signage shall not be illuminated outside the establishment's hours of operation, which was a condition that another member suggested. So, um, so that's what, I, what I've said about, about signage. Okay, I have a question. Sure. Let's let's say I own some property down the road, and uh, the applicant comes to me and says, "I want to put up a, a sign." Um, <laughs> does that apply to this um, condition? So he comes to me and says, "I'm going to offer you fifty dollars a week to put a sign up down the road for uh, for your business, Mr. Costa." Uh -huh. So to you, Mr. Chair, so I, I think that the way that this condition is, is crafted, it, it arguably would. Um, you know, the, the, the applicant could argue that, well, well, no, this was a special permit that issued for the locus. It's applicable to the locus. Um, but I, I think that this condition would, would cover that circumstance. So maybe if, if, if that's something that the, the board doesn't want to preclude, then you know, maybe we should be clear about what we're saying. Maybe we should identify the mass dot property specifically, property owned by the Commonwealth, however we want to state it. Um, you know, may, maybe, we should, um, maybe we should modify the condition to, to uh, be more specific to the exact concern that the board has. Other comments? Anyone else have a comment on what I said? So my, my main concern is really for the applicant kind of subsuming and taking over the mass dot property as their own, erecting signage, maintaining it. Um, I mean, we've, we've had a poor history with the owner of the property taking down those trees and didn't want to see another usurpation of, uh, of the Commonwealth's land for the purpose of, of this applicant. Uh, I can respond to that, John. I know people that have had property along that five and 10 and they went around and made them move all their signs back. So they have, the state has enforced um, 
some of those laws, I think, off the center of the road and they're right away. So uh, that's what I've seen. Uh, whether it's going to happen here or not, I, I don't know. But I know that they did require people to move their signs back because they were in the towns uh, in the state's road right away on five and ten. And I think it was 40 feet off the side of the road, I believe. And, and I know the state can do that, but we should have the authority and power to mandate it ourselves if the state you know, looks the other way on this thing. Okay. I mean, I, I Adam Saklas. Yes, Adam. Yeah, I, I think that it's that it's okay. Um, how it is, I, I wouldn't worry about property down the street. I would, I don't like what, you know, Dunkin' Donuts does with their flying signs down there, you know, on the state property, they put up those temporary signs and, you know, I, I don't want to see that here either. Um, I, I just, I don't, I think they, I don't, I don't like them at all. I don't like them anywhere. I don't like those temporary signs. I just don't think they look good. Any other comments? You know what I mean? And I think this covers it. I mean, okay. And I think that any other person or any other property, whether it's this business or any any other business, if they're going to erect a sign, they have to come, you know, besides what's you know allowed by right, you got to come for a permit. Okay. So I'm comfortable. Okay. So uh, con condition 11 is uh, a relatively simple condition, just acknowledging the need for necessary approvals from MassDOT and making that a precondition as uh, the board has stated during certain sessions of the public hearing. Uh, condition 12 is one that requires some feedback from the board only because I got, um, I think from three different members, I got a suggestion that there be a limitation on hours of operation. Um, and in fact, yes, it was three members. So the most restrictive hours or most conservative, I guess I'll say hours were from Mr. Staberski, and that's the 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, Mr. Decker suggested 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. and Mr. Sarkolowski suggested 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. So I got three different versions. I you know, included in the text here the most restrictive, but that wasn't meant to give precedence to, to, to one over another. Um, I, I mentioned the others in the notation here and I defer to the consensus of the board as to what is appropriate. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Uh, I was using the six o'clock to the 10 o'clock to make sure that the Bob. store couldn't operate, couldn't operate 24 seven. Okay. I just want to make sure that there's people not going in there at two o'clock in the morning, et cetera. Okay. I could go with Adam's, Adam's suggestion. Um, I don't have a real problem. I just want to make sure it doesn't operate all night. Uh, may I give yeah. some rationale why I gave a, the eight to eight? John, so John, John. I was concerned. You need to. So. John Staberski. Oh, thank I, you. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. So, uh, so my concern, <coughs> so my concerns are one, the implications of of the neighborhood. One is the disturbance to residents of traffic nearby. To the uh, activity level with school with school buses going in and out, I think I, I wanted it to open after after the school buses kind of went through that area, and I thought eight would be it. I know there are school bus stops on Mill Village Road. There, the school buses are going through that intersection. I have personally witnessed school buses having difficulty you know, with the length and the speed of traffic, kind of going through that intersection to get to, um, uh, to get to North Main Street. And we certainly want to take care of our kids. So that's why I had an eight o'clock opening rather than a later one. And I might be a little off on school buses. I don't know if anybody else has any better uh, information as to when a, uh, the, the grammar school bus goes through that intersection. And, and the eight o'clock time deadline was really just to be respectful to the neighbors, not to have you know, uh, there's going to be a sign with lights. It's probably going to shine in people's windows. Uh, there's going to be parking lot lights. And, you know, some elderly people like to 
go to bed at eight o'clock at night. Some people who aren't elderly like to go to bed at eight o'clock at night and probably don't want to have the lights out. So, I mean, I think when you are an applicant who de is desirous of locating adjacent to a residential area, um, you have to accommodate your neighbors. And, and, and I pulled eight to eight. I, I, it's not set in stone, but those are the considerations I had when, when I was kind of fixing those numbers. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Costa. So I, I just want to offer, it might be the appropriate time to say it because this conversation ought to happen at some point uh, in the course of tonight's review of the decision. Um, if it is the, the will of the board to approve a special permit, and by the board, I, I mean a super majority of the board to approve a special permit, um, there are a few things worse than approving a permit only to end up litigating the permit anyway, because uh, something that you've included within the decision is uh, so significantly objectionable to an applicant that uh, it requires a, an appeal. And it's not a, a wholesale appeal. You're not litigating some of the issues, findings of fact or uh, traditional or, or standard or routine conditions. It ends up being a much more circumscribed appeal, but you're, you're, you're litigating um, certain conditions that can't be complied with. And we'll talk about this a little bit when we get to the end of the decision where I've incorporated as a separate section some other conditions that I, I had some potential issue with, concern with, that they might be viewed. Number one, I had some concerns about their ambiguity or their lack of specificity or their legality. Um, but I also had some concern that they might be so significant that they might be viewed as, uh, for, for lack of a better phrase, a, a poison pill within the decision that would essentially convert this approval to a denial. So. I don't know for certain what the, turning back to condition 12, what Dollar General's proposal, I know that that, you know, we, we've said that this is a retail sales establishment, but it's also been, been made known to us that the proposal is for, at least initially, a Dollar General operation. And we've seen that on the signage and elsewhere. Um, I don't know what Dollar General's typical operating hours are or what they were proposed to be for this site. Um, I did have another, another project I was aware of um, and I think those hours were 8 to 10, 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. Um, so one thing the board will need to sort of consider as we, as we wrap up this process, whether that's tonight or it's at a future meeting, is you know, the extent to which when we, when we hone in on a final decision, it's a final decision that we, you know, the applicant hadn't seen this before tonight either because it wasn't, if it wasn't gonna be circulated to the board, it wasn't gonna be circulated to the applicant. So, you know, that's a discussion that we should have at the appropriate time. So, uh, John Stabersky, uh, Mr. Costa, are you suggesting we hold on the hours of operation till you could connect with, uh, with the applicant to see what their intentions are and, and, and what they want to do? So that may be a wise a wise approach, or the approach is agree on you know what what you think you can agree on, and um, if the board opts to continue these discussions beyond tonight and give the applicant an opportunity to more fully vet this decision too, for me to speak to the applicant's counsel, I can't take in and then report to you quote unquote new information. I can't say well isn't it true this and isn't it true that, but the applicant's counsel can communicate with me and say you know conditions 12, 13, and 14 are the poison pills. And if you approve it with those conditions, you're going to get an appeal anyway, because we can't build it. We can't build it if you limit our hours to, you know, 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. We can't do that. So that's why I offer the comment now, because I think hours of operation, it tends to be one of those hot button topics that, um, especially when you're dealing with these, um, these franchise operations or these larger enterprises, Dollar Generals, Dunkin' Donuts, uh, Cumberland Farms, um, they, they have sort of established hours that they feel that they are beholden to. And, you know, ultimately the buck stops with you, but it's something to consider. Okay, Adam, I think you had your hand up. Uh, yes, I mean, I can see where they can argue the unreasonableness of some of, of this. What about, um, you know, 14 hours? And, you know, if they can be open 14 hours a day. 
it's six to nine or they want to open at seven or, or whenever, I mean, how do you, I mean, in your experience, how's that work, Adam? So, so through you, Mr. Chair. So, um, so, so that, that's, a, that's a different approach. I, I can't say that I've seen that approach. Um, um, I'm not sure if I've ever seen it before. I certainly haven't seen it with much frequency. And I think the reason for that is not that it doesn't work necessarily, but that what prompts um, a, a, a permitting authority to want to restrict hours of operation are the sorts of concerns that Mr. Staberski had cited, has cited to already. So concerns about disruption to the neighborhood late into the evenings, if they're open at 11 p.m. or, or midnight, um, the, the lights, the noise, the, the headlights of vehicles from employees leaving at midnight, and then on the on the opposite end, you know, conflicts uh, before rush hour, whether it be with school children at bus stops or again with just disruption in the early morning hours. So you see 14 hours, and although I think this is unlikely, you could have an applicant that says, "Okay, then 14 hours, we're going to open at 4 a.m. <laughs> and we're going to close at you know whatever 6 6 p.m. and we're going to be open our 14 hours." And that wouldn't address the concern. So I tend to see these parameters more. You can't open any earlier than X. You can't close any later than Y. And it just depends upon what's acceptable to the board and what the applicant tells you, you know, they, they, can, they can negotiate with the powers that be on their end. Mr. Sokolowski. Yeah, I, I just, it's just tough because at different times of the year, there's a lot of different things going on. You know, today, telling them that they should close at, Eight, I mean, I, my, I still think 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. is reasonable. And I would probably make that motion because I think that that covers it. I will second it. Well, I haven't made it yet, Mr. Decker. All right. Um, because I think in the summer when it's light out to almost 9 o'clock, 8 p.m. is early. People want to are, are out later. And then, you know, in the morning, uh, I mean, there's a lot of people that are early shoppers. I mean, they want to get things going, but you know, you don't want deliveries and you don't want everything else and stuff going before 7 a.m. for the neighbors. So that's my thought. And I will go ahead and make a motion that we do the restriction of 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. Seconded. I have a second. Okay. Motion is before the board. Motion for the hours of 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. Am I correct? Correct. Okay, and well, yes means that we're gonna incorporate this into- um, can, can we have discussion on the motion? Of course. Yeah, well, I thought we discussed it enough, but it's, it's up to you, John, if you wanna discuss it. No, we, we, this is, uh, we haven't, I don't think, we haven't discussed specific times. Okay. I, no, yeah, I understand, go ahead. Uh, you know, and this is a motion was just made. And so, uh, so I think the better course is to find out when Dollar General wants to open rather than dictating it now um, and find out what their intentions are because Adam, this could actually even be a poison pill if they want to stay open to 10. And, and, and what do we want to do about that? And I, I think not having that information I mean, my preference would be to give due deference to the neighbors and to make this as as comfortable a relationship as possible. Um, and hopefully Dollar General would see it that way. Uh, but I, I don't think we should be telling them without having what their hours are going to be without having their input and letting at least them know that at least I'm desirous of having them be you know, sympathetic to, to their neighbors for opening and closing. So I would, so I, I would vote no, but I'd actually make a motion to leave this. Uh, if it goes, if it, if it fails, I'd move that we leave the time unspecified until attorney Costa can speak with attorney Donahue, find out what, what they can live with. And, um, and then and then uh, discuss it further, and decide then. Mr. Chairman, 
Yes, Mr. Decker. You know, we've been talking about this permit for over a year. And it was my understanding we were going to wrap it up tonight. Now, this kicks a can down <coughs> the road. Now, are we kicking it down the road four or five days? Uh, when is our drop dead date without an extension? One week from today. One week from today. So by at uh, eight o'clock or six o'clock at night, or is it? Uh, when the town clerk's office cl closes, that needs to be filed with the town clerk by next Wednesday. So it has to be. So, so we're going to say three o'clock. Three o'clock. Yes. So we'd have to meet on Monday or Tuesday. Now, the we're scheduled for a training session. I don't remember what night it is. Tuesday. Tuesday. Now we could hold a a brief meeting on Tuesday night and vote that one issue if you wanted. But you know, I. I would really like to get this thing moved down the road. Um, Jeremy? I don't know where everybody else thinks. Yes, Mr. Costa. I, I can represent to you that Dollar General's normal business hours would be 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. Okay. Uh, a comment on this, this issue about the noise. Um, this, this land is adjacent to farmland. And my hours for farmland are pretty early and pretty late. So this, these people who live there are adjacent to farmland and they hear tractors running substantially during certain times of the year. So yes, I know it's a problem with what they're saying, but uh, they also have farms, farmers next to them, which, do, which, are, which are sometimes they're early in the morning and late at night. So the noise issue, well, um, you know, it's there. Unfortunately, you build both farmland and you have these, uh, and we've been to court over this in town, is a right to farm. So we have noise issues there already. Um, I think we need to move and take a vote. Um, and if Dollar General or who's ever applying doesn't like it, then we can hear about it. But I think we need to take a vote tonight and take a stand on this and not kick the can down the road. I, I, I'm not comfortable with that. So question. But, uh, Mr. Decker. Mr. Chairman. Did Mr. Costa just say that Dollar General typically operates at eight o'clock in the morning until 10 at night? That's Did correct. I understand? That is correct. Okay. So I will withdraw my second. If Adam withdraws his, his uh, previous motion and we do the eight to 10. I'm fine with that. Why don't we do eight to nine? That was uh, Adam's original motion. I, and I just, late night is different than during the day, Bernie. Nobody's driving yeah. tractors around 10 o'clock at night. Well, well, uh, okay, uh, John. I'm gonna, you know what? I, I, I'm going to make my motion again, and I, I want it to be voted on. I'm going to go 7 a.m. to 9 p.m., seven days a week. I, I second it. Move the question. <coughs> Mr. Sokolowski, please repeat your motion again that we're voting on. I request that the hours of operation by the applicant will be between 7 a.m. and 9 p.m. 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. that they will be open for customers between that, that time. Do I have a second? Yes, you did. Okay. So we're voting on from seven to nine. A yes vote means we're gonna we, we're gonna put it in our audit conditions that they're gonna be open from seven to nine, seven a.m. to nine p.m. seven days a week. Seconded by Bob Decker. Seconded by Bob Decker. Okay. <clears throat> we're going to vote. I also said in there they'll be open for customers during that time. Um, okay. That was part of my motion. Okay. For retail Thank operations. You. Okay, Mr. Decker. Yes. Um, Adam. Yes. Yes. I vote yes. Alex. Yes. And Mrs. Tversky. No. Okay. Uh, motion carries four, four to one. I think we can move on to the next one, please. 
Okay, so uh, condition number 13 was also responsive to a comment received from a member relative to deliveries. And uh, there was some discussion during the public hearing process about uh, perceived or, or concerns uh, with uh, conflicts on site between multiple delivery vehicles. So the way that this condition was structured, um, and I've not verbatim what I received, but close to it, the deliveries of goods and products to the retail establishment permitted here under shall be coordinated such that no two delivery vehicles will be on site simultaneously. Um, I then ent entered this next sentence because my concern there, I'm trying to, I'm just trying, trying to structure a practical condition that actually functions the way that I think um, the board or at least this, this member wants it to. Um, my concern would be, remember, this is a, a special permit issuing for the quote unquote locus. The locus is um, not the property immediately adjacent to routes five and 10. It's not the property through which the first many feet of the driveway runs. That property is MassDOT property. So my concern is, well, then do we have delivery vehicles that are pulling off of route five and 10 and just idling along that driveway. And if that's something that the board wants to permit, then so be it. But my sense is that you probably don't want to permit that because number one, I'm not sure MassDOT wants them there. And number two, even if they did, by if these are uh, vehicles of any meaningful size, they're now reducing the width of the entrance exit driveway for uh, patrons, for emergency or whatnot or for the delivery vehicle that's exiting that's already on site. So I have this second sentence that delivery vehicle shall not park or idle within the entrance exit driveway or any adjacent roadway while awaiting entry to the locus. I don't know how this condition works in practice necessarily. Um, I'm not sure how much control uh, Dollar General or any future tenant of this site will have with regard to when deliveries occur um, and minimizing the potential for, for uh, simultaneous arrival. But again, I've, I've crafted it based upon the request I got and I leave it to the board to debate amongst yourselves whether you wanna do this and how you wanna structure it. Well, clarity to me. Other comments? I guess it seems to be okay. All right, so the next condition 14 is a condition, um, again, a request made uh, by a member regarding a bus stop um, or multiple bus stops potentially at or near the locus. Uh, so it reads that the applicant shall request of and work cooperatively with the FRTA to establish bus stops at or near the locus. If the FRTA agrees to the creation of these bus stops, the applicant shall complete and install the same at its sole cost and expense prior to the issuance of a certificate of occupancy for the project. And I took a bit of liberty with that second sentence. I've crafted similar conditions before when uh, regional transit is something that a municipality desires, an additional bus stop or multiple bus stops and recognizing that you know the board is only one player the applicant is only one player. It requires the FRTA to have an interest in doing this. And um, I would say you can't obligate an applicant to do something that the applicant can't, can't physically legally do because it doesn't control the FRTA. The best you can do is require um, an applicant to, to, to pursue and to work cooperatively with that entity. And if the entity authorizes it to then complete the installation and so at its sole cost and expense and to do so before the facility is, uh, is, is functional. Mr. Chairman? Yes. You know, the FRTA might want to put it on part of the state locus there. Um, is this going to be restricted that they have to keep it on Dollar General's property? Mr. Chairman, through you, it says at or near the locus. Okay, fine. I didn't happen to see that. Any other discussion? Okay, Adam, I think we can move on. All right, so the good news is um, we're about halfway through the condition. The next, the next several of them are, are what I would call those sort of standard conditions I referenced before. Um, not um, a couple of them modified a bit by some member input, but 
Condition 15 simply requires uh, compliance with the Americans with Disabilities Act, the Mass State Building Code, the AAB's rules and regulations. Um, those would all be required anyway, but I think it's good practice to explicitly state that you expect those requirements to be satisfied. Um, condition 16, similarly, might be deemed repetitive because some of these laws are already on the books, but that the applicant is required to, um, to, to, to minimize noise, vibration, dust, and blocking of roads, um, and using reasonable means to, minim to, to, to minimize inconvenience to residents and businesses in the general area during um, the, uh, the construction of its, its project. Um, 17 is one that was the result of a member comment that the applicant shall use, and again, I've chosen the term here, reasonable efforts, um, although I think the term was somewhat similar in whatever I received from the member. Uh, the applicant shall use reasonable efforts to source construction materials and to employ contractors and subcontractors from within a 25 mile radius of the town of Deerfield. Um, this is not an unusual condition per se. Um, some applicants object more than others do. Um, if you're requiring reasonable efforts, I, I think that it's therefore a reasonable condition. It doesn't require them to uh, utilize extraordinary efforts. It simply requires them to, to, to undertake some, some, some reason, reasonable, meaningful attempts to source their, their materials and their, their contract crews locally. Um, condition 18 is a, again, I would qualify it as a standard condition, um, but it's an important one. It goes to this issue that's already been raised a couple of times and that's enforcement. So it explicitly gives the board the town's building inspector and their respective agents, the authority to enter onto view and inspect the site from time to time to ensure compliance with the uh, provisions of the, the approval. It says that the enforcement authority is expressly vested in the board, but also in the building inspector and in the Deerfield Police Department as may be necessary. This is not um, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the perfect, uh, condition that will give you every last thing you need to ensure that enforcement can occur. Some of the issues we spoke about before may still exist. Um, despite the condition, you could have an applicant that refuses access to the site, requiring you to go down to the courthouse and get a warrant. Um, those sorts of things happen even with the condition here, but the condition bolsters the authority of the board. Um, the argument can be made that it was included in the, in the approval and that the, the applicant didn't appeal the approval and therefore is bound by the condition. Bernie, Can may I make a suggestion? Yes. Um, <clears throat> sometimes I've seen uh, conditions that say that a manager, a current manager, always be on file with the town so that the building commissioner zoning enforcement officer has a direct contact to make enforcement. Because managers change <clears throat> over time and just. Mr. Sadowski, Mr. Sokolowski here. Yes. I can make that motion if you want, if it's something, I mean, I think it's a good idea. I. Some companies are obviously better than others that went with uh, letting town hall staff know who's who's the right point of contact. I'll second it. Mr. Costa's already typed it in. I'll read it when he's done typing here. The applicant uh, the applicant shall provide the town with twenty four hour emergency contact information for a manager or other person in charge of the facility. Condition 18. Okay. I think it's a great suggestion. I think it's a great suggestion. Thank you. Read it again, Bernie? Can you read it again? Uh, I, Adam I has it all typed in on here. I have it on. I have it here, but I, I think you need to read it for the record. I'll read it one more time for you, Bernie. The applicant shall provide, I make a motion that the applicant <clears throat> shall provide the town with 24 hour emergency contact information for a manager or other person in charge of the facility. Do I have a second? Yes. We have a second. Mr. Decker seconds. 
okay, we're instructing Attorney Costa to put this in on <clears throat> number 18, uh, motion for uh, 24 hour emergency contacts. So yes vote means we're gonna <clears throat> instruct uh, council to put this in on the audit conditions. <clears throat> vote, <clears throat> Mr. Decker. Yes. Um, Adam. Yes. Uh, I vote yes. Alex. Yes. Sorry, I didn't hear you. <laughs> and John. Yes. Okay. Uh, unanimously carries five, to five yeses, affirmatives. Okay. <clears throat> um, I think we can continue, Mr. Costa. Okay, so um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Condition 19 addresses other permits and approvals. This is an important one, um, particularly for a project like this that requires multiple other permits and approvals. Um, I had alluded to it already when we were uh, discussing the, the findings of fact, and we spoke about uh, the requirement of um, uh, to assess impacts to the natural environment. We talked about other permits and approvals from CONCOM and from planning board. Uh, this condition simply says that, that to the extent that the project requires another permit or license or approval from any other board commission, official or other agency from the town or the state or the federal government, whether it's because of the project as it's been designed and proposed by the applicant or it's a result of a condition that's been imposed in this decision, it's the applicant's responsibility to seek it. And then finally, in the last sentence, that any discrepancy or discrepancies between the documents and plans that are now being approved and those approved by other permitting authorities requires the uh, plan approved by this uh, permit to be modified through an amendment process. Um, and again, that amendment could be a minor amendment or it could be something that is really akin to a whole new application because the scope is, is, is far reaching. Um, so that's what this condition hopes to achieve. Um, I do have a, a comment here that I'll make note of since you can read it for yourself, but I'll say it anyway, that um, Mr. Straberski had, had requested a condition and it's one that I, I, um, I frankly wish I could give him because it would maybe make my job a bit easier and other, other projects like this in other communities. But uh, the proposal was that should the applicant initiate any further litigation against the town, its conservation commission or its planning board, that this special permit shall be deemed revoked. Um, I, I will tell you just candidly, um, that I have concerns with that sort of a revocation. Um, certainly, I think that the end result, again, is the same. If those permits aren't issued or there's litigation that ensues that prevents those permits, even if they're issued, but the applicant is dissatisfied with the conditions of approval and appeals them, that prevents them from becoming final. Um, absent those final permits, um, the, the, the building inspector ought not be issuing a, a, a building permit. Um, while there are certain, certain, there's a certain ability for an applicant to proceed at risk under a special permit, there's no equivalent ability for an applicant to proceed at risk without a, a final order of conditions, for example, from the Conservation Commission um, or a final site plan approval from the planning board. So the end result is the same. The, 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 the sort of um, protection that the town has lies in the building department um, and not issuing a, a building permit, but I, I don't think that there is authority to rescind this permit simply as a consequence, and I'm, I'm not sure this is exactly what Mr. Staberski was saying, but simply as a consequence of an applicant exercising its appellate rights with respect to another permit, I'd, I'd be concerned that that would, that would uh, be due process violation, anti-slap, whatever you want to call it. Mr. Chair? Yes, John? Uh, so, Mr. Costa, what I'm trying to drive at is that this application has, you know, cost the town a tremendous amount of money in legal fees. Not that you don't deserve it, because you do, um, but it's just, it's very, very expensive process. And, and that should be borne, in my opinion, by the developer. So I am trying to 
I know I have another condition that I put in and, you know, I'm not somebody who practices in this field, but uh, in, in contractual documents and other pieces of litigation, you, you have incentive clauses that try to disincentivize litigation, whether it's cost bearing or other penalties for, for, for bringing it. So I'm trying to incorporate something like that into the special permit so that you know, we, we deter litigation or save the town some money. Is there anything we can do other than what I kind of just tried to think up myself? So through you, Mr. Chairman. So um, so I, the, the specific um, comment, and I wonder if I can put my finger on it. Um, it it's here in, in, so maybe we'll discuss two conditions at once because they are related. So condition number 21, showing it now on the page, says that all invoices that are generated by the board's consultants during review of the project shall be paid within 20 days, whether the decision is appealed or not. And the, the justification for that is there is a, a statutory process or at least a statutory mechanism, chapter 44, section 53G, that gives municipal boards the ability to collect fees from an applicant and to engage peer review consultants and to use the applicant's own money is to fund consultants who are uh, who owe their loyalties to the board. They represent the board and the town's interest and not the applicant's interest, even though the applicant is funding their, their engagement. Um, so that's why condition 21 is here, acknowledging that those fees need to be paid and that post permit reviews wouldn't be conducted nor would any building permit or CO issue until those invoices have been paid. Uh, similarly, with respect to, to that topic, um, Mr. Staberski had proposed the condition you see here in, in the margin that the applicant would bear all legal costs arising out of the application and any subsequent consideration of the special permit. The challenge here is that, and, and like you, Mr. Staberski, in addition to practicing mun municipal law, I represent private clients from time to time too. And so I find myself negotiating contractual documents, sometimes it's settlement agreements, um, sometimes it's an agreement to avoid settlement. And, I also like to incorporate contractual provisions, what we refer to as prevailing party clauses that act as a disincentive to litigate. That if you litigate, if your litigation's frivolous, if you're unsuccessful, not only do you lose, you're gonna get stuck paying the other guy's attorney fees too. The challenge is that we're not operating in a private contractual relationship here. We're operating as a governmental entity consistent with public policy and in, in, in pursuance of very specific but very limited statutory authority to do that. And less limited than in some states, we've got home rule in Massachusetts, so your boards have more authority than they might elsewhere, but that authority is still limited in many respects with what's consistent with, as I mentioned before, public policy. So there is case law that addresses this issue of shifting attorney fees to an applicant. And a lot of that case law, in fact, arises in the Chapter 40B affordable housing context because those projects tend to be sizable, meaningful, grueling for boards to review. They occur over periods of many months or years sometimes, and they're expensive for towns. And towns have attempted to shift their attorney fee burden to an applicant. And what the courts have said, what the Housing Appeals Committee has said is, well, it's one thing if the applicant agrees. If the applicant agrees to that, well, you know, who are we to step in to, 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 to meddle with an agreement between the parties? It's like anything else the applicant might offer in the, in the course of the permitting process. You want improvements to the intersection? Sure, here's a plan for them. You condition it. And if you look back at that condition, you'll see that I've worded it carefully that the applicant has offered to make these improvements and we hereby require them to document the fact that that was something that was offered by the applicant because arguably it's well beyond the purview of the board otherwise. When we start talking about attorney fees, um, when we start talking about waiver of appellate rights, the case law suggests that municipal boards can't do that. I don't like it um, because frankly, I don't care who's paying my fee. I would much rather have it be the applicant than be the town I work for. Um, but I'm just telling you that absent acquiescence by the applicant, I think that that's difficult. I think that if, if we are going to engage in some limited um, review or allow for some limited review of this decision once it's in essentially final form by the applicant to tell us whether there's a poison pill. If you wanted to estimate fees, if you wanted to include a requirement and see if the applicant is willing to acquiesce in the interest of getting the deal done, sure, I'll pay, I'll, I'll compensate or reimburse the town for its attorney fees incurred as part of this process, then 
certainly I would encourage you to do that and I'll, I'll, I'll advance that with the applicant. But if the answer is no, I think, and, and I don't know how else to say it, and I hate to sort of say it publicly, but I think you're on shaky ground, including it as a mandatory condition of approval. So if that's the case, Attorney Costa, can we uh, you know, do as much as we can and request that your fees for this process uh, be paid by the applicant? I mean, how, how far can we go in terms of doing that? So I can certainly advance that request. I mean, I can do an accounting to get a sense as to what it has cost down for me to be involved. And of course, I, I would say, and, and maybe this isn't something that board members want to hear either, but I would say that to the extent my costs are going to be passed along, legal fees are going to be passed along, I think that the, the most the board could require would be fees incurred in connection with the special permit that is before the board and within the board's purview. I think that attempting to seek reimbursement for um, uh, other, other <coughs> advice consulting I've provided to the town with respect to CONCOM proceedings or my representation of the planning board in the litigation that's underway. Um, I think that would be on the purview of the town, but certainly I can advance if it's the will of the board, um, a request of the applicant that uh, my fees to the planning board or associated with planning board representation be reimbursed. What does everybody else think about that? Mr. Sokolowski. I think that people, corporations, municipalities are entitled in this country to their appellate rights. Um, whether we agree with them or not, I'm a firm believer in due process. Um, in, in general, it's a you know, firm believer in due process. So I think we're outside of our bounds to try and limit anybody's due process rights. And I, I don't think the judicial climate in the Commonwealth would err on our side of limiting people's judicial rights. Uh -huh. And then, you know, whether it's this issue or any other issue, I, uh, I think other boards need to do what other boards do. I don't think that it's appropriate for us to try to carry the torch or put the fire out, however you want to look at it, um, for any other board. Um, other than making sure that the the applicant, whether this applicant or any applicant, is in in compliance. So I think that based on what I heard Mr. Costa say, we're on shaky ground, which is a I think a lawyer's nice way to say. I can try to defend this, but this just isn't going to work for you. Um, and, and, and go from there. I, I, that's where I stand on it. Maybe, maybe. Uh, <clears throat> can I just. Oh, the Jen had her hand up. Jen. Yeah. So I just want to remind everybody to please say their name because people who are on the phone don't know who's talking. So the last comment was made by Adam Sokolowski. Thank you. <clears throat> Look, John, John and, and Adam, maybe you misunderstood what I, the question I was posing. Uh, I was, I was, uh, you know, discussing with attorney Costa and it, and it, and I understand his issues and his point. I don't want to have anything in this. That's going to be too risky. Uh, but we can request from the applicant that the legal fees that the town has expended for this special permit be funded by the applicant. <clears throat> and that they basically pay attorney Costa's fees for, or we request, we cannot obligate. And, uh, and I don't think it hurts to make the request to see if, I mean, they're, they're going to get a win here, uh, given uh, the other four members of this board. Uh, maybe, they, maybe they would be willing to uh, voluntarily pay for the legal expenses the board's incurred to get to this point or for the special permit. Mr. Sokolowski. Yeah, I, I definitely think it's great to ask people for money. Um, you know, I, I definitely think that we can ask, but I don't think it's, you know, I don't think it's a bad idea to ask, but I think that we have to remove some of this in the conditions to make it a legal document. I mean, to a document that's 
um, going to stand up because I, I don't want to, I don't want to lose the other conditions, you know, and have, and it, you know, that's, that's my stance. I don't know how we should make a motion on this, or I, I think what's highlighted is what Mr. Costa says is on shaky territory. What should be, how we should proceed. Mr. Chairman, through you. Yes. So I, I've I've not included anything either in condition 19 or 21 that is you know quote unquote on shaky ground. My comments about potentially being on shaky ground were really addressed in my my, my marginal comments here, both as seen on the screen and then further up here as well. Um, I think that what could be done, you can you can vote it if you want, and we can remove it um, later. Is you could propose to include in condition 21 requiring payment of the board's consultants invoices that the board's legal counsel is included. And we can, I can make that request uh, through attorney Donahue and see if there is a willingness there. And if there is, then there is. And um, if there isn't, there isn't. This presumes that this decision doesn't get voted tonight in this form. You would vote the change, but then you'd change it back later if the answer is no. Comments, Adam. I would like uh, Adam. Yeah, so I was called on, so I'm talking. I I would like to vote on this tonight. I got things coming up next week. Um, I think we need to wrap this up. I know it's getting late, but we got we got a few more to go here, so. So, Mr. Chair, if that's the case, the only thing that I could foresee doing, and, and again, there's a there's a risk if the board votes tonight without applicant input that any of these conditions could be the the and I hate to over overuse the the uh, the phrase, but the poison pill that um, could be problematic. But I I suppose if you wanted to somehow work this in, um, and I, I wonder if by doing this you're you're really cutting the legs out from beneath you anyway. But you could say, you know, including the board's legal counsel but only if so agreed by the applicant. Um, you know, it, it, it's then not a binding condition. And if the answer is no, the answer is no. Again, the answer could be no in advance, but if the answer is yes in advance and you work it in as a condition, then it becomes enforced. In this form, it's really left to the whim of the applicant. So up to you. Mr. Sokolowski. I mean, unless there's a will, the board to meet, you know, like during the day on Friday, noontime, I, I just, I got a lot going on in the evenings and I don't think it can wait really till next week. I, I, I don't know. Cause we got to 48 hours to post the meeting, right? So we can't just, we can't, we need that 48 hours to post the meeting or I guess. Yes. We do. Uh, Mr. Chair? Yes. Uh, Mr. Mr. Costa had indicated that they, we would have, that the applicant has said we could have another week's delay if we needed to, so we wouldn't be uh, hamstrung. I, you know, these are really important things. I don't think we should rush these. I think we should, uh, you know, get their feedback. I mean, any of these. Um, we should make sure we're, we're kind of, doing the right thing here. Um, and I think if we have an, uh, um, so I don't, I, I don't think we should rush into anything. I think we should, you know, I mean, we've put this much time into it to, to bring it to a premature close and is, I don't, I don't think that's, that's in the best interest of the town. Jennifer. Um, I just want to mention that um, the posting needs to happen between the hours in 8 and 3.30. So we need the 48 hours to be within that time frame. And then I have to check to see if we have any other meetings or availability. So there's a couple things to take into consideration with that. We couldn't even do it this Friday, John Stabersky, right? Well, today is Wednesday, so no. We could do it on Saturday. You 
I, yeah. I agree with Adam. We need to take a vote on this and, and move forward. Or we're going to be stuck with this going on and on and on. You know what? We, we really need to make some decisions for or against and, and, move, and move on. We need, to, we need to move on. Otherwise, we're cutting it very close. Um, I agree with Adam. We need to vote on it. Do I have someone make a motion that we, um, so we're, what are we going to do with this? Leave this on, take it out. What do you want to do? I don't want to, I don't think we should be begging money from the, de, from the developer. I mean, this, this is the cost of doing business. We have, right. you know, if you want to, next time you want to change the, the application fee, uh, make it a bigger application fee. Uh, you know, that's a, that's a different thing. But to, to ask them and go begging for money is, I don't think it's appropriate. Okay, so I have a motion here that we do what? What are we looking for? Mr. Decker. What is it? What is he exactly saying here? <laughs> I have trouble time reading it. Would you so read Mr. It, Mr. Chairman, Decker? through you, oh, if, oh. If, if, if there's no desire to seek a reimbursement of the town's legal fees, then there is nothing to discuss and no motion to be made. Okay. If there is a desire to include a reimbursement of attorney fees, then the board has to decide how to incorporate that language. You could incorporate that language by, by doing what I've proposed here on the screen in red. But that's only if you decide that you as a board wish to seek a reimbursement of those fees. Okay, so we're looking for a motion to add this, is that correct? Am I correct? Right. Okay. Do I have a motion? A motion to add what? Uh, are we? As it stands now, it's going to be. This is not in here. Am I correct, uh, Attorney Costa? If we ex if we vote, you explain it again, please. Now, I'll, I'll move the language that's there. Um, that's that's on the, it says including the board's legal counsel, but only if so agreed by the applicant. So that satisfies uh, your Mr. Sadowski's and Mr. Sokolowski's interest in not uh, continuing this any further. I mean, I think it's a travesty. We've put this much time into it, but we're rushing through these things. Well, okay. Adam Sokolowski, I'll second the motion, but part of the discussion is I wanted to meet last, last last week, not be touched, you know, right up against the deadline here. And and no one else on the board, everybody on the board said, well, you know, we're busy or whatever. We didn't want to meet in January. We wanted to meet here in, in February. So, you know, the drop dead dates the ninth and, you know, we get to post the meeting and then, you know, I don't, apparently, you know, obviously the town hall staff normally doesn't work on the weekends. I mean, I could do 3.30 on, on Saturday afternoon, but, you know, I got, I got doctor's appointments to deal with on Monday and it's probably going to put me out of service. And then we got, um, going to, trying to get away at the end of the week because this is supposed to be wrapped up before the ninth, you know, or they get their permit without us, without all these conditions. So that's why, I'm, you know, here past my bedtime trying to get this done. <clears throat> May I make a comment? Yes. So I think what I heard Adam say is that if you don't want to do this, there's no question and you can just move on. Like if you take a vote, but am I incorrect with that, Adam? So the, the decision as it's drafted. Yes no requirement that the applicant pay the town's legal fees. That's how the decision is currently drafted. A proposal has been advanced, uh, was advanced in, in a request received from Mr. Staberski amongst the conditions he proposed, like, like other members sent condition, conditions as well. Right. And his condition was that there, there be a reimbursement or a payment of the town's attorney fees. If that's something that the board wants to do, you need to work it into the decision. And I've proposed one way you can do it. But if the board doesn't want to do that, then there's nothing to be done except to continue on with the discussion of the conditions. Mr. Costa, could I 
I mean, I don't, I'm not going to ask you for an exact amount of your bill, but could you tell us the general air vicinity of it? Are we talking 5,000 or 50,000 kind of thing? Um, sure. What kind of money so, are we talking here? So, so part, part of the challenge here, and I don't know that this um, necessarily helps helps your case to have too much of a, a detailed discussion um, publicly, but, but maybe, maybe it does that the applicant's willing to spend some limited money, but not significant money. So, um, and this is, this is public information, so I'm happy to share it. Our arrangement as a firm with the town of Deerfield is, and, and it's our, our arrangement with many of the communities in which we do work, is that we don't bill for routine service on an hourly basis. We, we, we operate on a retainer basis, meaning that um, the municipality, the town pays a monthly fee for our services. And that monthly fee is the monthly fee, whether you call us 10 times or you call us 100 times, whether we attend one meeting or we attend 10 meetings. Um, our, our clientele has viewed that as a positive thing because it provides for consistency. And we feel that it sort of comes out in the wash for us, that some months are busier than others. We may only get 10 calls in July, we may get 100 calls in, in February. So it's not as easy as me looking at bills and saying, well, I build a, a rate of X and I build X Y number of hours. It's really sort of backing out of all of those invoices over the course of the past year or so since this came before the board in January of 2020. And looking at you know, what percentage of that bill, determining the effective hourly rate for that month and then determining how many hours were dedicated to Dollar General uh, or to the proposal that's before you. Um, for many of those months, there was no time dedicated at all. We, none of us were doing much of anything with respect to this application in March, April, May, June, July uh, because of COVID. So I attended a, a meeting in January, reviewed some materials before that, did nothing for the ensuing six months or so, and then became more heavily involved and quite heavily involved beginning again in the August timeframe with monthly meetings. And then of course, recently within the past few weeks, in reviewing materials, drafting a decision. So even, even at an effective hourly rate being where I think it would be, the number is not gonna be 50,000. The number shouldn't even be you know, half a third of that amount. It's gonna be some small fraction of that amount. Um, it, it could be 5,000, it could be less than 5,000, it could be slightly more than 5,000. <laughs> it's closer to that number than it is to 50. Given that billing arrangement and to expedite this for everybody's purposes, I'm going to withdraw my motion. Uh, that's, although it's a lot of money, it's not enough money to gum this up and make it difficult for people. So sorry, folks, I probably should have asked that question in the beginning. Yeah, that's why we have meetings. We might disagree, but we know what we have a right to say something. And, you know, you have to understand that we're not angry at anybody who makes suggestions. That's what we're here for. So I'm not offended by it. Okay, let's move on. All right, so we, we discussed, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, conditions 19 and 21. We, we skipped over 20. Um, and 20 simply says that no work shall commence, nor shall any building permit or certificate of occupancy issue unless the applicant's in full compliance with all permits, licenses, approvals, et cetera. That's a Again, a standard condition and one that uh, ought to be included, included in most of your decisions. Uh, same can be said for 22 and 23. These are standard conditions that you ought to include in every decision you, you issue. The first is simply the traditional lapse provision in se section 5360 as authorized by statute. Special permits lapse within two years of their filing with the town clerk if substantial use or construction hasn't commenced except for good cause. And then 23 says that the decision must be recorded with the Franklin County Registry of Deeds. Again, that's a statutory requirement, but it never hurts to reiterate it as a permit condition. So those are all the conditions that I incorporated, would have incorporated based upon feedback. The, the next series of conditions, there aren't many of them, three, four, five, six, Mr. seven Costa. conditions. Yes. Mr. Chair, I, I have one comment on- uh, yes. Uh, uh, John, John Staberski. Yeah, go yes, ahead, John, but you have to, we had a complaint. I understand. John Staberski, comment on the last uh, par last phrase in, in section 22, except for good cause. 
Um, does that have to be in there? Is that statutory? It is. It is, okay. It is, and there's there's case law that dictates what constitutes good cause. That, like anything else, it's a you know it, it's it's determined on a case by case basis, and it is left to the discretion. But that that provision, which is taken from your bylaw, is copied directly from the statute. Sorry, to, sorry to interrupt you. Okay. Um, so the, these other conditions are ones that um, I've got some issue with, and as I indicated here in my comment, it, it's not that I don't want to incorporate them. It's that either they're, uh, they're vague or I think that they arguably are beyond the scope of the board's jurisdiction or potentially even expose the, the board to some appeal if the board were to include them. So let's just discuss them and I'll give you some sense of what I mean. So um, condition 24, should the information data or expert conclusions submitted by the applicant to the board and upon which the board relied in issuing the decision be deemed inaccurate, incomplete, or erroneous by the building inspector, the board may revoke or rescind the special permit. So I don't disagree with the premise here that if there are misrepresentations made, that there should be some, some recourse and the law provides some, some form of recourse. Um, I, I question whether this concept of revocation or rescission of the permit is a, an appropriate means of recourse or a, or a statutorily authorized means of, of recourse. Um, the Zoning Act speaks to enforcement through the building official. It speaks to issuance of cease and desist orders and appellate rights that ensue once those issue. It doesn't so much speak to revocation or rescission of the permit. Um, so I, I, I at least wanna provide that warning to the board. I, I did, this is not verbatim what I got from a member. It's something that I tweaked a little bit thinking that if you did want to incorporate it, it could be incorporated, incorporated in this form. So I'm not telling you you can't do it. I'm just sort of telling you that if you do incorporate it and you later determine that something was incomplete or erroneous and you decide you want to act upon it, you need to act upon it with eyes wide open that there, there, there could be a challenge and it's of you know questionable validity, I guess. Um, again, not anything that I think will would, would spur uh, uh, an appeal, but something that you, you need to be mindful of if you opt to incorporate it. Comments, John, uh, John Saberski. Attorney Costa, uh, if you think the remedy of revocation of the permit is, uh, is what is a cause for concern, is there another remedy that <clears throat> would would be uh, appropriate uh, through you, Mr. Chairman. So I, I think that there's a couple of things that you could be done here. You could you could state it um, very very vaguely that um, after the comma here, you know, should should the information data or conclusions be inaccurate, incomplete, or erroneous, comma. Um, appropriate enforcement action may be pursued in accordance with chapter 40A, something like that. Um, so that's one approach. The other approach, if you didn't wanna simply state what already is the law, um, whether you state it or not, is that you could, you could go the route of requiring um, that an applicant, for example, um, upon request by the board, uh, appear at a, a, a subsequent public meeting of the board to um, pr present, uh, pr present an explanation or pursue an amendment of the permit to be consistent um, with the new information or the corrected information. And then the failure to do so could result in further enforcement action being taken. Um, I've got a board that has a condition like that crafted that they use for a lot of their projects. Um, so th there, there are some ways you can go with this as opposed to saying you'd revoke or rescind the permit. I, I, quite frankly, I like the <clears throat> amendment because that is something we've used in our other conditions. And if other towns use that, that would seem to be, you know, the appropriate way to uh, to make sure that the information that we've decided on is accurate. Um, I, I don't know what the sense of the other board members are. You know, you, you as you probably can tell, this is this is my proposed. Uh, condition, 
but if it's consistent with another towns and it can be reworked, I'm, I'm happy with it. I'm, it's just, it's not my field. So I don't, not really didn't know the revocation of the permits kind of outside our statutory responsibility. May I make a comment? Yes. Chair? Um, it says the building inspector and our building inspector is our code enforcement officer. So I'm wondering if that should be like just added in there that he is our code enforcement officer that um, will deem this process. Isn't he also the building commissioner? He is. So rather than building inspector, should it be the code enforcement officer maybe? The, yes, the zoning um, enforcement officer is what I think the correct wording should be. And that's Adam, what would you suggest? So through you, Mr. Chair, I, I have no preference. Um, if, if in most communities, the building commissioner or inspector, the, the building official is also the code enforcement officer. That's not the case everywhere. Some communities have designated uh, code enforcement officers, but where that person is one and the same in a community, I, I simply refer to that person by their usually known title, which is building inspector or commissioner. It, but it, it's a question of terminology. And as I stated at the beginning of this process, I have absolutely no pride of authorship here. So I'm happy to use whatever term is consistent with um, the, the, the lingo that's used within town offices or what you think is best used to describe the role that that individual would be playing. My understanding of it is when the building inspector or code enforcement officer takes a look, he can stop the project immediately. Am I correct, Jen? Well, it's, it's what it says here that they're going to be inaccurate, incomplete, erroneous by the building inspector. I'm suggesting to the board to take into consideration that it says building commissioner because that's also our code enforcement officer. Um, because of what it's inaccurate, incomplete, or erroneous, like he would make that decision. Because if, let's say, there was a um, complaint, he's the person that would go out and, and then look at these conditions and then address the applicant or the manager or whoever on, on the premises about it so that he would take care of it. So I just feel that building commissioner would be the correct verbiage. <clears throat> My understanding is what would happen is he would go to the clerk of works and I assume they're gonna have a clerk of the works on this job and he would approach the clerk of the works and say, we got a problem here and we'll address that issue. Well, I, I, Since I, Bob is not here, we can't uh, address that. I'm so sorry, Mr. Mr. Costa. I, I, I do think that you know part of the confusion arises, and if, if it's a terminology difference because you have local inspectors, but you also have a commissioner that runs the department and is the zoning enforcement official, then we should be using the term commissioner throughout this decision. That's just me using a phrase that was not entirely accurate, and I can go through and find and replace the term inspector with commissioner. The building inspector, excuse me, the building commissioner is the zoning enforcement official, is the code enforcement officer, and in that capacity, he or she is essentially wearing two hats. They're enforcing the building code. And so when you talk about clerk of the works and so forth, those are building code requirements. But that same individual is also wearing the hat of zoning enforcement official and the zoning enforcement official enforces the zoning. This is a zoning permit. This special permit has nothing to do with the Massachusetts State Building Code. It's a zoning permit. So the authority that the building commissioner has under this permit is zoning authority. And that authority would be in the event that there's a violation of the permit, the building commissioner could issue a cease and desist order. Now that uh, allows the, the recipient to avail him or herself of their appellate rights. They don't have to accept that cease and desist. They can appeal that cease and desist and there's a process for doing that. Um, but certainly they can, the, the commissioner has the authority to quote unquote stop a project by issuing an order that the, the applicant is out of compliance with its permit. Okay, further discussion. The only other thing, Bernie, is is this building probably is over 35,000 cubic feet. It's right. likely that the is a PE that's gonna have a construction control affidavit 
Excuse me, this is everything. Bob Decker talking. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. All right. It's a, if it's over 35,000 cubic feet, there's a construction uh, control affidavit. It has to be filed by, I think, a PE or an architect on any building over 35,000 cubic feet. So the building inspector doesn't get too, too involved with too much because the thing is on the construction control affidavit. Just for your information. That is true. That is true. And I think it's gonna be over, what, what did you say it was, Bob? 35,000? 35,000 35, cubic feet. Well, if it's 9,000 square feet and it's got a 10 foot ceiling, we're over. Yeah, that's 90,000. Yeah, right. so we're way over. Yep. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so do we, are we uh, gonna have a motion on this to change the... Um... I move that we adopt the amendments that Attorney Costa made to paragraph 24. Okay. I'll second. Okay, what now? So Mr. Costa, tell us what that was, please. So we know what we're voting on. Yes, so as you see on the screen, the proposal yep. is that should the information, data, or expert conclusions submitted by the applicant to the board and upon which the board relied in issuing the decision be inaccurate, incomplete, or erroneous by the building commissioner, the board may require amendment of the special permit to comport with the new or corrected information, data, or conclusions. That's okay, how so the new condition would read. Okay, so we, we have the motion. I seconded it. Well, okay, so we have the motion. Say so your that, name, please. Bob Decker. Okay, so we've got a second. So this is what we're voting for. The amendments stated on by Attorney Costa. <laughs> okay, this is 19, right? 24. Oh, I'm sorry, 24. <coughs> The yes vote is going to uh, give him the, uh, the uh, tell him to change it. Mr. Mr. Decker? Yes. Um, Adam? Sokolowski, yes. Yes. Um, I vote yes. Alex? Yes. And uh, John? Yes. Okay, so it's a 5-0 five, five oh yes. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Uh, up above the that paragraph, it says other conditions. They might want to remove that. Correct. Okay. I think we can move on. Um, okay, so uh, condition number 25. So um, and, and when I deleted other conditions, I deleted my comment, but my, my comment again went for all the conditions that follow here just having a concern about the, their enforceability or their, their, their specificity. So this is an enforceability issue that I had with condition 25. It reads, neither the owner nor the applicant shall alter or seek permission from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts to alter any of the flora or fauna and fauna on the mass dot property situated immediately adjacent to the locus, except for such alterations as are required for installation of the driveway between the locus and route five and 10. So my only issue here is that we're, we're attempting to regulate in the form of a condition, a property that has not been made subject to this permit. And I understand that the, the, the lines are, are blurred a bit because the applicant is proposing an entrance and exit driveway that runs through that same property. But in terms of its alteration of flora and fauna, that property is not deemed the locus, at least portions of it that are beyond the, the, the entrance driveway, exit driveway. Um, and I, I just have a question about the enforceability. I'm, again, I'm not saying you can't include the, the condition in an effort to establish the intent of the board, the position of the board, that there be no such alterations on the adjacent property. But I don't know that, strike that, I, I do know that the board has no authority to uh, refuse uh, a property owner the right to seek permission from a state agency to do something on property that is owned by and, and controlled by that state agency. So that's my only issue here. It's 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 a it's conflicting powers. It's enforceability. Can you include it? Sure. Is it going to prompt an appeal? Unlikely. 
but can you enforce it? That's a different question. Uh, Mr. Chair? Yes. John Staberski here. Uh, Mr. Costa, I uh, recollect, and I hope my recollection is accurate, that this was a representation that Mr. Donahue had made during his presentations relative to uh, that property. I, I specifically asked him about it. Um, and that's one of the reasons I included it to make sure that, you know, uh, it, it would be embodied in a condition. Comments, questions. Is that part of the minutes uh, by any chance, Bernie? I don't know, John. Uh, Mr. Decker, that was that's Mr. Decker. I do not know. I do uh, not know. I would, Mr. Decker, John Staberski here. I would tend to doubt it because our minutes have not been that specific in general, uh, reflecting that. Any 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 representation of the applicant like like that. Okay, <clears throat> we're going to take an action on this. Do we have anyone that likes to? What well, we're to saying it. We're we're basically Mr. saying. Decker. Yes, I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Chairman. We're, what we're saying here is the applicant committed to the foregoing during a public hearing. Um, you know, members recall it, but I don't remember. Um, I just want to make sure we're not um, setting ourselves up. Okay. I, I Adam Sekolowski, comment. Um, yeah, I, I just, I don't see a enforcement on this. I, I understand where the verbiage is coming from, but I, I guess we could leave it in. I, I don't, I don't. Yeah, you know, my, my thinking on this, John Staberski. Uh, John Staberski again was that, you know, it was many, many Deerfield residents were upset with the removal of a substantial part of mature trees on that site. And, um, and, and I, you know, I questioned Mr. Donahue uh, markedly on on that and that was a representation that he made and I think it's you know it there's not been great uh, good faith shown by the property owner in, in removing those trees so I wanted to to have a, a you know a public statement and if it's enforceable great if it isn't it isn't um, <clears throat> but I think I, th I think for the for, for the benefit of the folks of our town who are uh, upset about what happened, that that should that that should be stated in the order of conditions. So you're making a motion that that's yeah. I'm, well, I'm, I'm, that's I'm, I'm, no mode would be no motion, correct? Because it, it's here, it's on yeah, here. It's correct? on here. We just move to the next one. Right. Any other comments? Okay. So um, is, the, is, the, is the consensus through you, Mr. Chairman, that we don't need the last sentence that I've just typed in? I, I would move that the last sentence uh, be a motion that you add the last sentence, uh, amend paragraph 25 with the sentence, the applicant committed to the foregoing during the public hearing on the application, just to be perfectly legal on it. Okay, so then we have to take a vote on this then. Need a second. Okay. Do I have a we? So this is your you propose this, Mr. Staberski, correct? So this is going yes. to be number 20, 25. 25. And uh, we have an addition here. Um, applicant committed to the foregoing during the public hearing on the application, correct? That's what you have correct. down here. Yes. Okay. That's what Mr. Costa drafted. Yes. <clears throat> okay. So a vote yes means we're going to add this to number 24. Uh, Mr. Chair? Yes. 
Uh, this is Alex. Um, I'll second that motion. Okay. I think we had a second though, didn't we? Oh, whatever. Okay. Vote taken. Mr. Decker. Uh, I had to turn my mic back on. Um, it's the council for the applicant that committed to that, correct? Is that right, John? It is. But I think I, I think uh, he was representing the applicant, and I don't think you have to parse it that closely. Well, I think I just language want... is appropriate. All right, it's fine. Okay, Mr. Decker. Um, I don't think it's necessary. Okay, that's so. That's a no. Yes. Uh, no. At, and Adam. Uh, I'll vote uh, yes. Um, Alex. Yes. Yes. Mr. Staberski. Yes. Now, is this a straight vote or does it have to be a majority vote? Simple majority. Okay, because I'm, I'm going to vote no, but that means it still carries. We three yeses, three yeses, and two noes. So it's going to be changed. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> can you continue, please. So uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So conditions um, 26 and 27 both relate to, um, and in fact, even 29 and 30. So four of the next uh, five conditions relate to uh, green, green so-called green energy improvements. Condition 26 says the applicant shall install roof mounted solar photovoltaic panels or arrays to meet the locus's energy needs. Condition 27 says the applicant shall install an electrical vehicle charging station with a dedicated parking space at the locus in a location to be determined by the applicant. Condition 29 says the applicant shall comply with MassDOT's Green Dot Sustainability Initiative, particularly to enhance pedestrian and bicycle access and safety. And then condition 30 says the applicant shall incorporate green design standards and utilize renewable energy sources in its development and subsequent use of the locus for the purposes authorized here under. So my concern with all four of these uh, conditions, some more than others, is the, I guess the, the, the timing of the conditions, the lack of specificity, and what it means for the project. So it is no small undertaking to obligate an applicant to install solar panels on its roof. Um, th there is sometimes more, to, more involved in terms of structural stability of the roof and how the roof is designed, especially for non-residential buildings. There is a cost involved in, in, in installing them. They, they don't work on every site. I, I know enough about this site that I, I suspect it probably has um, uh, su sufficient sunlight exposure for them to work here. But this is not something to my recollection that was ever discussed with, with, any, with any meaningful detail with the applicant. Um, the electrical vehicle charging station is something that was referenced during at least one session of either the public hearings or the deliberations, I can't recall. Um, but I do recall it being mentioned at one time, but I don't recall there being enough of a dialogue with the applicant about whether it was something that was going to be offered. So those two I think are um, meaningful costs for the applicant. 26 lacks a little bit of specificity, maybe, maybe not, but there, there's probably a, a, enough of a cost involved in either or both 26 and 27 that they're, they're risky in terms of exposure to an appeal. 29 and 30, um, I think lack specificity. So what's involved in an applicant complying with Green Dot Sustainability Initiative? I know what that initiative is, um, and I reread it when I crafted this condition because the condition didn't have the last piece about the objective here of the sustainability initiative, but to do what? So enhancing pedestrian and bicycle access and safety. We know that the bicycle path or the connection has already been uh, incorporated as part of the project. That was something negotiated with the applicant. What, what specifically is the board asking the applicant to do? And does it involve a redesign or a, an additional design to the project that shouldn't be happening during the deliberation stage? 
And then same thing with incorporating green design standards and renewable energy sources. That might have been a discussion to have with the applicant during the permitting process, but not something necessarily without much greater specificity and knowing that it could be a source of appeal to incorporate into a decision. So the combination of vague conditions and conditions that I think in their current form could prompt an appeal has me concerned. So I've reduced them to writing. I've added some specificity and clarity. They're still pretty simple conditions. They're a sentence each, but I sort of looked to the board and to, I think it was, it was certainly more than one member that cited to some of these. I sort of looked to you to give some feedback on what you're trying to accomplish here, what the board as a whole is trying to accomplish and whether these are significant enough that you want to incorporate them. And if so, how we add the necessary specificity and how we, we, we limit the potential exposure of the town to an appeal. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Bob um, Decker? Yes, on number 27, um, if you're gonna leave it there, you gotta change building inspector to building commissioner. Uh, but my concern deals more with people dropping their cars off at nine o'clock at night and charging them all night and having people on and off that site charging cars up. Uh, whether or not the neighbors are gonna be particularly receptive to that, that idea, I don't know. But I just I just think we're going too far by requiring it. But if I don't think people should be going in there after hours to charge a car. Okay, John, uh, you know I I agree with you, Bob, and I think we should say during uh, have it during hours of operation to add that to that. Uh, and, and let me, that was my, one of my, um, and maybe somebody else chimed in on the EV station. I actually did a little research between now and then in Eversource in terms of cost, Mr. Costa, if a new business wants to put in an EV station, Eversource, which is our electric provider in Deerfield, will do it for free. So it's, there's no, fi there's no financial cost. Um, you know, you can just Google Eversource EV new construction now, it pops right up. So it's, so it's a, a no cost addition, but it's something that is, is you have to, you know, plan for it and dedicate it. Jennifer, question, comment. <clears throat> comment. I was wondering if you could add to that uh, what um, Mr. Staberski just said and say it's, they're available only during business hours, the charging stations. Just a thought. So, so let me move to amend. Uh, amend um, twenty-seven. Well, maybe. Yeah, Mr. Costa is doing it as we speak. So great. He needs to go back and change building inspector to building commissioner. Okay, at least on this one to put this one to bed. Can I can I move to amend to incorporate Mr. Costa's language that he's drafted? Okay, <clears throat> so we're gonna the vote here is going to be to amend twenty seven to add a charging station by the <clears throat> approval by the building commissioner operation only during retail establishment hours of retail operation. And I don't know whether they can, whether they put a timer on these or not, because that's the only way you're going to do this. And I don't know what the other ones they've had in the past. The ones I've seen do not have timers on them. So we're going to run into a problem that I think it can, is a concern that you have people in and out of this uh, facility um, at night. And I can see that's a real problem. I wouldn't want that in my backyard. And I can see where that could be a problem. But <clears throat> just pretty just, lucky. Yes, John. Uh, I know you can you can put a lock on them that they can't. I mean, it's, it's like a it's like a gas pump. You can lock it up if you need to. Okay. It's it's simple to. Okay, so they, they can be controlled. Yeah. All right. So, uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, this is Alex. Yes. Um, I will second that motion. Okay. So we have a <coughs> a motion to amend twenty seven 
Charging station shall be operated only during hours of retail established and hours of retail operation. Okay, Mr. Decker. Yes. Uh, Adam. Sokolowski, yes. Um, I vote yes. Uh, Alex. Yes. And John. Yes. Okay, the motion carries five to five yeas, no nays. Uh, to add this on. So we're back to uh, 26. <clears throat> Questions or comments on 26? Adam. Adam. Uh, my idea was 26, but I think we're too late in the process um, because I don't feel as though we gave the public any input if the design was shown with just the roof that they showed people might say that they don't like it and there's also i think some community concern about the reflection i read that in the draft planning board bylaws so i'm going to make the motion to remove 26. do i have a second 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 it okay we have a <coughs> motion to remove 26, which is the photovoltaic cells and arrays. <clears throat> Bob? Yes. Uh, Adam? Yes. I vote yes. Alex? Yes. And John? Stay. Okay. <clears throat> All I can tell you is, in my experience in putting these in, that they have to have substantial uh, engineering studies done on roofs because of a roof imbalance. So it is a substantial change for them. Um, in some cases, not an easy one and not a cheap one, depending on how the building is built, but they, they, can, be, they can be complicated. Okay, next one, 20, 28 with no, the window not. issue. Mr. Chairman, we, we haven't we, we haven't addressed 2930 yet, which I already read and we already spoke about. Oh, I'm sorry. Design. Sorry. So, uh, John Staberski here. I, I can speak to both of those. Is um, is I I wanted to have some kind of guardrails on what the design standards and uh, and goals of. Um, of, of the applicant would be in constructing the facility. And, and these design standards are advisory. Uh, they're not mandatory. So it was more of suggestive language that they need, that they should, you know, look at insulation, look at power consumption for the lighting. Are they gonna do LED or incandescent? I mean, I, I don't think I wanna be in, in, in micromanage a business as to how they're going to do every little aspect of it but if they but to generally have a, as green a building as is feasible that that's the objection with these two i probably didn't hit the target i mean particularly 30 um uh, 29 is you know is is sustainable in a, in a different way with with pedestrian uh and bi bicycle work so it's it's basically trying to incorporate the state standards into what they're doing. Mr. Chairman? Yes, Mr. Decker. I might suggest that Mr. Staberski change it, change the wording to be the applicant is encouraged to try and comply, okay? Not as a requirement, but encouraged to uh, look into it. And, and the same with the other one. That's what you want is to get them to look at it and not make it a requirement. Or use their best efforts to comply. I, I, you know, I don't, you know, something like that. I don't. Well, I, I understand where you're coming from. I just think that uh, you don't want to make it a requirement, but they should be encouraged to do the, those types of things if, if it's feasible. Okay. Um, hand is up, Jennifer. Hi, I just wanted to, um, let everybody remember that Deerfield is a stretch code community. So there is certain standards for that that they have to hold by. And the building commissioner 
will make sure that they hold to those stretch code requirements. So that's certain level of insulation, certain um, UV on the windows. There's, there's a whole Massachusetts stretch code and they are required to do that in order to build their building. And that's part of the building code. Thank you. Any other comments? Uh, yes, John. Uh, Mr. Costa, could you um, suggest what would be appropriate language that would, uh, you know, not make this a poison pill, but something that would send a, uh, a message to the developer would use best efforts or reasonable efforts uh, to comply with? I mean, I don't think we want to mandate, uh, given given what your your opinion was on those, but uh, I'm wondering if you could suggest a revision that might be appropriate. So through you, Mr. Chairman, to uh, Mr. Staberski. So I, I think that your language, either of those is fine. I, I've just highlighted on the screen what we did when, uh, what I did when I attempted to address the request that, um, that construction materials contractors be sourced from within a 25 mile radius. I had, I had trouble mandating that because I don't know what's available within that radius. Um, so I use the term reasonable efforts, um, shall, shall use reasonable efforts. So it's, it is a requirement to use the reasonable efforts. So they can't do nothing and claim that, well, you know, we, we understand we were encouraged, but we, we, we see your encouragement and we reject it. Um, it requires a bit more than that, but uh, I said reasonable efforts. Could you say best efforts? Is best efforts better than reasonable efforts? Maybe. So I think you could say either of those two things if you want to sort of um, find the middle ground between uh, obligating compliance, the, the, the straight up use of the word shall, and simply saying encourage, you could say use best efforts or use reasonable efforts. Uh, Mr. Chair? Yes, John? I, I, would, I would suggest we can maintain consistent language throughout our conditions. And if we used reasonable efforts, I think we should continue with that language, but I defer to uh, the other members of the board and see what they think, if they think it's even worth putting in there. I mean, I. Okay, John, I can, I can make a comment on the electrical stuff because that's kind of something I know a little bit about, but uh, I see Western Mass Electric that kind of limits me in my time, but um, they come in a lot of times and put stuff in with LEDs and light, they do an energy study. So they're gonna, they're, and some of that stuff they pay for. So it's on the lighting, I think they're gonna cover that pretty well. Um, I know that they do that because they did that at the high school and it's, it'll save them money by them doing it to keep the uh, energy usage down. Um, so I think that will be covered, but I think it needs to be in there myself. Okay. Hey, so I, I would move that we amend uh, paragraphs 29 and 30 as Mr. Costa has uh, so drafted to add use reasonable efforts to. Seconded by Adam Sokolowski. Okay, so hang on a second. So do we have, we have to do them separately though, I believe, correct? I think it can be, it's one motion. I don't think we have to do it se separately. Mr. Costa, can we do it by one or can we do it by can we do it by two? One motion's fine. Okay, so we're gonna do 29 and we're gonna do 30. Change to use reasonable efforts in both 29 and 30. Okay, vote time. Yes. <clears throat> Bob is yes. Oh jeez. Um Adam. Yes. Uh, I vote yes. Alex. Yes. And John. Yes. Okay. Motion Mr. Chairman. Carried five to five yeas. Yes, Mr. Decker. On 28, what have we done on that? We haven't talked about that yet. That's what I was going to, I jumped ahead. I'm sorry. Mr. Costa. Yeah, so, so we skipped over 28 because it was unrelated to the other four. Um, so 28 says design enhancement shall be made to the building to improve its compatibility with the neighborhood, including but not limited to the addition of six over six full windows on all sides. So 
Uh, you know, I've got a few different concerns here, and, and this is not, these are not concerns that I would necessarily have during the permitting process. I think that um, on the one hand, design is something that is generally less in the purview of the, the uh, zoning board issuing a special permit for use than it is within the purview of the planning board, which issues a site plan approval. And in fact, on the issue of full windows, there has been, or at least there was at this point, a year and a half ago, or just over a year ago, there was substantial discussion with the applicant about the incorporation of faux windows um, you know, uh, as part of the building design. And uh, I think that you know what we've ended up with sort of speaks for itself in terms of the, the result of those discussions, which I understand involved the planning board and not the zoning board. So part of my concern is where we are in the process if you had requested these during the during the, the permitting process before the hearing was closed and you were requesting changes be made to the design of the building, even then your jurisdiction would have been questionable. But to do it now, I, I just, I have a concern um, about whether that's, that's legitimate. And then beyond that, this sort of including but not limited to in this general reference to design enhancement. So, if you're going to require design enhancements, not not notwithstanding what I just said about timing and jurisdiction, if you're going to require them, certainly at a minimum, you've got to be very specific about what those requirements are going to be. So, six over six full windows can be one, but um, what size six over six full windows, and how many of them on each side, and how you know equally spaced apart or not equally spaced apart? You don't know what you're going to get because you haven't made this request and allowed the applicant to say yes or no and submit design drawings and uh, uh, send them out for review and approve them. And that can't be done as uh, during the deliberation stage in the process. So that's why this condition is at the end of the decision in this other conditions category and not elsewhere, because I didn't have enough information to even craft it, let alone my concerns about the ability to, 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 to um, impose it upon the applicant. So with that, I, again, defer to the board as to what you want to Mr. do. Mr. Chairman? Yes, Mr. Decker? I think we should remove number 28. Seconded. Seconded. Okay. Uh, we're, okay, we're going for a vote on um, condition 26 to remove. Uh, 28. Uh, 28. 28. Why don't you oh, restate so your motion? I removed uh, from discussion number... What was printed as 28 design enhancements shall be made to the building to improve the compatibility with the neighborhood, including but not limited to, to the addition of six over six box windows on all sides thereof. To eliminate the total clause. Okay, do I have a second? Yes, seconded by Adam. Second by Adam. So we're voting to remove this 28. Is that, is that what I'm saying? Mr. Yes. Baker? Based upon uh, uh, the opinion of council that this is basically a site plan type uh, okay. item. And it's, you know, it's, and for us to bring it up at deliberations is, is not um, the best time. It should have come up before. Okay. okay. So we're voting to <clears throat> to uh, remove this twenty eight, uh, Mr. Decker. Yes. Uh, Adam. Yes. Kowalski. Yes. I vote yes. Alex. Yes. And John. No. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, any other comments? I think we have we covered everything, Attorney Costa. You have. There's um, there are a few. There's an additional page in the decision, but it's just the standard uh, voting in town clerk signature block and certification. So nothing else substantive. That's the of the decision. Okay. Uh, where did I put it? Comments by anybody? <laughs> and I, have a, I have a comment. Of course, I do. Um, I was wondering if the board would entertain a condition that says upon change of ownership, they, they need to come back to the board. Um, I, th I think that's standard, Jen. 
I think it needs to be written in. In my experience, I've seen that. Mr. Costa? There's no requirement that uh, upon change of ownership of the property, there, there be a return to the board. The, the permit runs with the land. Uh, the permit is being issued to an applicant and not to a landowner. So in, in, the, in the absence of a, of a condition requiring that, that would not be required. I couldn't hear what he said. Can you repeat that in the sense of, so it's not required for the applicant to come to the board if they sell and change ownership? Well, so so here's here's a, a bit of a problem with your question, um, Jennifer. Yeah, sure, just explain. I mean, I just want you to unravel it, so. Sure, so, so the, the applicant wouldn't be selling because the applicant doesn't own it, right? So right now you've got an owner and an applicant. Okay, so the business, so change of ownership of the business. So let's say they don't stay in Deerfield and they change. And so somebody else goes in there and they adopt this special permit, but it's a different type of business. Right, so in the absence, if there's not a condition that requires a, a return to the board in the event that the business changes, but it's still a retail operation within a 9,000 square foot building and they're still prepared to comply with all the conditions. They're still gonna have the electrical vehicle, uh, electric vehicle charging station. They're still gonna have the, the, the propane tanks not visible from the street. They're gonna comply. They wouldn't need to come back to you. They'd be operating under the same special permit. Okay. And it, 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 okay. Adam, talking, it wouldn't make sense to, unless it's a change of use. A change of use requires them to come back by bylaw. Correct. For site plan review. Okay. Uh, for, for whatever John, relief John, need John has a John Zabriskie has a question. Well, you know, I think Jennifer's uh, comment is is sage, and I think it should be either if there's a change in applicant or change in ownership um, that they that they that the special permit uh, they need to the, they need to come back to the board. Zoning Board of Appeals for a new special permit. Um, I think that's that's a very smart uh, smart uh, revision, and I, I I would support that. And I'll make a motion to that. And but I welcome discussion from people. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Decker, the uh, applicant is called uh, South Deerfield uh, DG or series. LC. All right. That implies that that's who they they've got it. These companies ch change things all the time. They merge. They do this. They do. That. I think that by putting a restriction in there and a whole different criteria for going back in for a new permit and everything else is really a poison pill. And I I think I think a little bit overkill. So. I mean, I hope, I hope that they don't assign the permit to somebody else, uh, but they're going to have to comply with all those things that we've gone through, and the building, et cetera, this and that, the hours, all that stuff. I just think that it's a little bit overkill. Uh, but I have a couple of other questions before we get ready to make motions and what have you. Is I need uh, council to to make sure that we make the right motion. Uh, to authorize the chairman to sign the uh, the permit, and uh, we make sure we get all the verbiage in right, et cetera, et cetera. So that's where I am. Mr. Costa, would you yes. address Mr. St uh, Mr. Decker's question, please? Hang on, I, I didn't hear a question, Mr. Chairman. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Uh, I, I think John, you had your hand up second. John, I'll, I'll defer to Adam. Adam had a Adam had his hand up. Okay, well, we gotta finish up. John made a, was going to make a motion or did make a motion. Let's not get ahead of yeah. ourselves. Okay, yeah, so <laughs> I was just gonna that's exactly <laughs> what I was gonna say. Uh, so, is, uh, is it Mr. Chair? Yes, I'm sorry, John. Go ahead. Go ahead, John. Okay, I'd like to make a motion. Okay. I move that should the applicant or the property 
owners um, desire a change. I'm trying to think of a good word for that. A change of a change in I don't know, maybe just a change that Oh, I see that Mr. Costa has already done some good drafting. I'll have to do it in my mind. Uh, prior to any change of ownership of the locus or transfer of the within special permit by the applicant, the owner of the applicant shall notice, notify and seek permission of the board. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to put in the last phrase there, which shall be permission shall not be unreasonably withheld. I think they need to come before us and, and we need to evaluate it. I will second that. Adam Sekulowski will second Mr. Stavursky. Okay, we have a second. Uh, any more discussion? Any more discussion? Anyone else? Okay, um, <clears throat> Mr. Decker. No. No. Uh, Adam Sekulowski. Uh, abstain. Uh, I'm voting no. Uh, Alex? Yes. And John? Yes. Yes. Correct. So we have two no's and two, <laughs> two yeses. So it's, I don't think it's carried. Am I correct? Adam, does that mean it's not carried? That's correct. You did three to carry. Mr. Uh, Mr. Yes. Chairman? Yes, Mr. Decker? That you asked uh, counsel uh, for the exact verbiage he wants uh, for the to vote this permit to make sure we authorize you to uh, to sign all the appropriate documents, et cetera, et cetera, and uh, do it forthwith as soon as you can do it, so it's filed timely. Okay. Um Attorney Costa, I can review, I think, what you told me. I have to, I want to read what the um, <clears throat> the proposal was, project proposal, correct? I need to read it first before I take the vote so everyone knows what they're voting for. And then I <clears throat> tell them it's a yes vote means we, we accept it. A nay vote means we do, do not accept it. And we need a super majority to pass this, am I correct? So that's all correct. I, I don't know that you, Mr. Chairman, need to read anything. I think that there needs to be a motion made and I, I, I can, I'm certainly happy to refer to the board of the board members or I can suggest a motion, but somebody needs to make a motion. Can I suggest one thing before you go forward? <coughs> yes, Jennifer. Thank you. If we could change all building inspectors to building commissioner throughout the document. I've done that. Oh, you're the best. Thank you. Okay, so I've got um, Attorney Costa, you've given me some information here on uh, outcome of the vote. Is that the one, uh, page three of thir three of eleven? Um, let me. Are you are you referencing the decision, Mr. Chairman? Yeah, I just want to go through this before we get started, so I understand what I'm doing here. So, so it, it's it's at this point we've been through the entire decision. There's there's not a whole lot to do. Somebody needs to make a motion. A member needs to make a motion. Okay. So permit uh, to sell Deerfield DG Series LLC for a nine thousand three hundred nineteen square foot retail sales establishment uh, per the decision just discussed and subject to the conditions just reviewed. Okay. So so move. So so move. So we have. Do we have a second? Um, Adam, okay, because I have to write down here on this slip of paper who uh, who makes the motions and who seconds it, correct? Adam, is that correct? I will incorporate it into the decision, yes. Okay, so we got <coughs> motion. <coughs> motion was by uh, Bob. Yes. And seconded by Adam. I didn't, but I guess I'll second it. Sure. Okay. I'm, I'm just trying to get the paperwork. Okay. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> I'm 
my voice is giving out. Um, on this paper, I have a Zoning Board of Appeal members and the voting record for the special permit. So I'll read the name off and then it's yes, or it's supposed to be A or an A or whatever, but I'm gonna go yes or no. Okay, <clears throat> this is for the approval. Yes means that we're gonna grant this special permit. I vote yes, Ms. Chair. Mr. Decker. Yes. Mr. Sokolowski. Yes, with the conditions as presented tonight. Um, John Staberski. No. And Alex. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> the decision is four, four in favor of and one opposed. I will drop this off tomorrow. Um, Mr. Chairman? Yes. So there, there's nothing that you need to drop off. Um, I'm not sure what you're referring to, but there's there's nothing that you will need to drop off. The uh, There's an additional motion that's needed tonight. The board now needs to vote to authorize this chair to sign the decision uh, subject okay. to the administrative uh, completeness item. <coughs> blanks that are in the, the decision for um, uh, the, the documentation. So we, we, have, we have a section for attendance. We have a section for key documents that were blank early in the decision. And I can work with Jen to complete those sections. Yep. Um, <clears throat> hers, you can sign, but we need a vote of the board to do that. Okay. So, so, uh, Mr. Costa? Yes. Okay. Is it uh, can and uh, can the members see the final decision before it's signed? Review it. Sure, it's a, it's a it's a public document now. It'll further drafts will be a public document because they're not going to reflect any further input from the board members. They're just going to reflect completing the list of key documents and filling in the dates that I was missing. So can can I mean now? I part of it is because we just saw this tonight. Um, and, and I'd really like to spend a little time with it and see the complete document. Is it possible to have it forwarded to the board members, say 24 hours before, uh, before the chair is scheduled to sign it? I mean, that, that's up to, up to the board and the chair. We can, it's as quick as Jennifer can put together the list of documents and complete that information. There's not a lot missing other than the attendance record and the list of documents. Yeah, what you have to do is, my understanding is, you have to authorize me to send this to um, the town clerk to be filed, correct? But then yes. So, so, so typically this authorization is simply, it's an administrative task. So you voted on the substance of the decision. Um, really the role that Bernie would play is he would show up at town offices, he would look at the version that Jennifer prepares quickly glance at the attendance record and the key documents to make sure that everything looks like it's in order and then he would sign it. So while I have no objection, of course, to circulating a draft 24 hours, 48 hours, whenever we can get it done before the, the date that Bernie signs it, circulating it 24 or 48 hours in advance doesn't mean that board members who review it during that 24 hour period can now make changes to it. You've already voted the decision. Uh, you know, I'm I'm looking for to make sure uh, the alienations that were made, the amendments, uh, just basically uh, uh, having another set of eyes on it and looking at it for completeness and accuracy. Okay, Jen. Jen has a response here. Jen. Yeah, I was just thinking that we actually saw Adam make those changes before our eyes, so. I'll be adding things like that he said that we're missing from it in the first place, such as um, dates that we put it in the paper and advertised and um, the attendance, make sure that that's correct. I mean, I definitely don't have a problem with sharing that, but I also think um, there is a time frame that we have to work with. And <clears throat> once it's prepared and looks accurate to the chair, I'm going to put it out front and he's going to uh, come and sign it. Is that I'm correct? I'm certainly happy, Mr. Chair or, 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 or Jennifer, um, even immediately following tonight's meeting to 
um, send to you, Jennifer, of course, and if the board members want to see it, send the red line version that you're looking at on your on your screen. I made the change in real time. Um, really, all that Jennifer is going to com be completing are the missing dates under the record of proceedings section. There's, a, there's four of them. The attendance record, I'm going to complete the voting record now. And then the key documents, one through five. Everything else will not change because that is the substance of the decision and it has already been voted. Okay, Adam Sikloski, I make a motion to authorize the Chairman Sadowski to sign documents and complete administrative tasks as needed for the completion of this special permit process. Seconded. Okay, seconded. Um, and, I, and I move to amend that it be sent to the members, uh, emailed to the member, the final document 24 hours before uh, Mr. Tis, the chair signs it. Why can't he sign it and you look at it? Because you're not going to change it. That's the way I operate. I like to I like to look at things before they're final. We we're looking. Yeah. Okay, it's gonna let's, be take, let's take the vote. Um, vote for me to authorize, Bob. Yes, <laughs> Mr. Chairman. There's an amendment. Oh, there's I'm sorry. There's an I'm sorry. There's an amendment. Do yeah, I have a I second on the second. do I do I have a second on the amendment? I'll second it. This is Alex. Okay. So that means we have to take a vote on this now. You have to take a vote on the amendment first and then on the yeah, That's right. The amendment first. So we're voting on the amendment to wait 24 hours. Okay, Mr. Decker. No. Uh, Adam Sokolowski. Dane. Um, I vote no. Um, Alex. Yes. And Mrs. Taberski is yes. Yes. Now we have to vote the main motion. Okay. That is, <clears throat> <clears throat> I probably won't be in here for 24 hours anyways, John. So um, it's going to be 24 hours. So All right, we're voting for me to for the chair to go and authorize this vote to town office, town clerk. Am I correct? That's how this works? So all the applicable paperwork. Right, with all the, pa with the paperwork that's gonna be completed. Am I correct, Mr. Costa? I, Mr. Chairman, I think all you're gonna be doing is you're gonna be walking into the town offices and signing a decision that Jennifer puts in front of you with confirmation, giving it a glance to be sure that it looks to be in order and consistent with what we just modified with okay. the document. You're gonna be signing your name to the document and I imagine that Jennifer or staff will coordinate getting it to the town clerk and having it stamped in so that we meet our deadline. So I gotta go on, I should go on and take a look at what we've got, all the changes we made and see if they're what I, if they were what I thought it was. Once once they're made, Jennifer has to sit down, I'll, I'll assist her and okay. put that list of documents together. It's been a, a year long process and we've got to capture those documents in the list. Okay, we're voting to, authorize the vote of the board by me in the town office. Uh, Bob. Yes. Uh, Adam. Yes. Uh, Alex. Yes. And um, John. No. I vote yes, it's four to four to one. Is there any other business to come before the meeting, Bernie? I, I have got nothing. So uh, old business, any comments? New business, any comments? Any business that we think might be posted in the next 40 hours if you heard from anybody about anything? Okay. Do I have a motion to adjourn? To adjourn? Seconded. Okay. Wait, wait, wait. I have, a, I have something. Don't forget we have our training. <clears throat> planning and zoning training with Adam Costa on the 9th, starting at six o'clock. So I would really appreciate it if you all come. How long is this gonna be? Adam? Half, half as long as tonight, Bernie. <laughs> <laughs> You're funny. You're funny. Adam? Another eight minutes, five hours. 
Listen, I've been working since eight o'clock, so. <laughs> oh, we all have been working since yeah. eight o'clock. Mr. Yeah. Costa. We, we, we try and keep these to a couple of hours and on rare occasions, they wrap up, you know, in an hour and a half, an hour and 45 oh. minutes. On other occasions, they go a bit over, but I, I, would, I would plan on a couple of hours. Okay, I am asking because my home computer, uh, I got something from uh, the Stone Age and if it goes too long, it overheats and shuts off. And I got words from my wife that you're not burning my computer up. Ernie, I think I may have a computer you could borrow. Okay. Okay. All right. Do I need to take minutes for that by any chance? No. Oh, you're funny. Well, <laughs> you know, thank you, uh, Alex, for, for, for doing the, um, uh, the minutes. Hopefully someone else will take that, uh, that over. I think no, that's, I, I'll keep doing it. I don't doing mind it? doing it. It's, okay. it's, well, that's great because I think that's sharp. That's a tough job. Okay. Uh, vote, vote to adjourn. Yes. Um, Adam. Yes. I vote yes. Alex. Yes. And John. Yes. The first yes was Bob. Yes. All right. Thank you, gentlemen, for your patience. He usually calls me first, so I just beat him to it. I heard that. I got, well, I got a, uh, I got my separate sheet here. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> Not the only thing I could do right. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you very much. And lady. And, and ladies, young, and thank you and for your And young lady. And young <laughs> one. Have a great night. Good night. Sleep yep. well. Bye.